Hello, and welcome to the Fiddler's Green podcast. I am your host, Dave Green. This is my maybe weekly, maybe monthly podcast where we talk about culture, politics, and various goings on online, specifically focused on dialectics and conversations that are happening on Twitter for the most part. But <laughs> so I'm trying to come up with a an intro for this podcast, but I've had almost zero time. So you'll have to put up with whatever I can come up with on the fly. Uh, this will be a very scattershot podcast, by the way. I've been trying to get more in the habit of doing these every single week, but for a variety of in real life reasons, I haven't had time to put together any kind of prepared talk. So I decided I'd just, I would just do a, a general conversation, a general breakdown of things I've been seeing going on on Twitter and in, in various other places politically. Um, this is, uh, I think I have, although I haven't been doing the podcast proper, the last few weeks I have been doing a number of live streams. A few weeks ago I had a conversation with Carl Benjamin, which people really liked. I mean, he's a very easy person to talk to. Carl is somebody that always has, and people usually, they always put him down for kind of being a lightweight early on YouTube. But, but the guy has a lot of ability for introspection and insight. I mean, that's what his real skill is, is to be able to kind of look at issues and kind of suss out the properties in them that are authentic and which ones are fake. Uh, that and kind of having a very resilient personality are two of Sargon's real strengths. And I think that's what's kept him alive in this game for so long after people have said again and again that he's done. Uh, but it was it was a very useful conversation. Uh and it was a very enjoyable one to have with Sargon. But strangely enough, it wasn't the one that stuck in my mind the most. For a very long time now, I've been kind of having this back and forth with this online lefty personality, Professor Matt McManus. And I, you know, I rediscovered him. We, we had a conversation in 2020 over the subject of, I forget, it was his book called Postmodern Conservatism. He was trying to, he was sort of trying to ride the coattails of the whole bread tube phenomenon. This was something that was a big deal back in 2019. And so in 2021, I interviewed him for his book. And what I got was a giant lecture about how evil the right wing was. So, you know, about four or five months ago, he did sort of a very scathing review of Curtis Yarvin's work on the blog Gray Mirror. And you no, know, I, I did a whole sort of response post to his his work where I use that as a means to sort of uh, create a larger point about surviving in postmodernity as people who are dissidents. But but I, I became really at once interested and uh, in kind of reengaging a conversation with McManus, not so much because I didn't know what he would say, but because I wanted to know how the conversation would generally go. I'm getting indications that this bit rate might not be very healthy. So I'm going to just check in here. Oops. If you guys can't hear me for any reason, then just let me know. I'll try to slow down. For the most part, there isn't usually a problem with the, the broadcasts. Last time people were telling me that the broadcast constantly flickered in and out. Uh, and, and you know, I looked back onto the VOD and it was perfectly fine. So I'm, I'm going to assume unless people just start putting Fs into the chat that everything is going perfectly fine and that I can just keep on going. Uh, but, but anyway, you know, this was, I, I wanted to have Matt on for a conversation because uh, I think people really underestimate this, this quality of trying to engage your opposition in dialectic. I think people will sort of misunderstand the point of it. Um, and now my chat's not loading, so I'm a little bit worried that I might not be broadcasting, but okay. So people are saying it's good, but you know, so so I, I, this is not the era of debates. For instance, when I started my YouTube channel in 2016, it was considered de rigueur that you would not only make most of your videos as response videos to other people's content. The response video was a big thing back then, but it was also considered just it was just assumed that that if you were engaged in a political conversation, you would go on for an hour or two hour conversation with other people who were making videos in this capacity, and speaking to the same topic. This was this was the whole reason why I got into doing YouTube. It was to, it was basically doing a critique of Christy Winters and Sargon's debate, which is a total uh, clusterfuck for a variety of reasons. Pardon me, I shouldn't I shouldn't swear, but. <clears throat> 
this is this was considered something that was a standard in YouTube. And it kind of reached a crescendo in 2018. And then after the blood sports scene completely popped, largely due to the prominence of sort of debate me bros like Destiny, and that's a whole other can of worms. After 2021, no one debated anymore. And, you know, people rightly bring up the usual rigmarole about debates. What's the point? No one ever changes their mind. No one admits that they're wrong. No matter what happens, they'll, you know, the people will always stay on their side and root for their team. This is true for a lot of the debates that, for instance, Vosh did. He was sort of infamous for this property, uh, for this sort of quality of his fan base, I should say. He he did a number of debates with, I think, Actual Justice Warrior and I Hypocrite, where he was just caught out and made to look a fool multiple times. And nevertheless, his side, his fanboys would always just declare him the winner. And he'd parade around saying that he he, he was the, the greatest debater of all time and blah, 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 blah. Usual internet blood sports debate me bra braggadocio. And, and I think this kind of disillusioned people with the entire idea of conversations. Uh, you know, the, the reason to have debates or, or the reason to have conversations with people who disagree with you is, is you're trying to sort of sar sharpen your ax, so to speak. You're trying to come in contact with a real thinking entity that's on the opposite end of a political dialectic. Oftentimes I get into conflicts with people, not so much anymore. But but every now and again, I used to get in contact with leftists on Twitter or on other forms of social media in my comment section. And after it went past two threads, I'd always say, OK, well, let's just have a chat about this privately. Now, I, I discovered that if if I could actually get them into a conversation face to face where we're conversing in real time, like in a phone call, half the time we could come to some form of disagreement or or I'd be able to see how their mind worked or I'd be able to determine what kind of person they were. But if the thing stayed in text, if it if it kind of proceeded in the same way with a back and forth with a with sort of a chat program, then there would be no point. All, all I would get is sort of rehearsed talking points blasted at me. And so you know, my, my interest with the McManus thing was to really speak to him and have him speak to me in, in the most personal way possible. And, and you know, this 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 sort of debate or conversation, if you want to call it that. This got de delayed for a very, very long time, and I don't think people really understand what was going on behind the scenes. But McManus was really, really, really resistant to my framing. I, I insisted as a, as a precondition for the conversation happening at all that it had to be either him or me convincing the other person of something. It couldn't be his lecture about what his theory of the right wing was or his lecture about what his theory of justice was. This is going to be a conversation where he talked to me and I talked to him and we tried to convince each other of something. That the whole idea was you talk to me, not about me. Because Matt McManus, that's all he does. He gets he gets paid to write whole screeds about about evil right wingers and the horrible injustices they're doing to society and how you need intellectuals like him to confront them or whatever or buy my book that's what left wingers want to read they want to read tracks about why it's right and good and just to exclude right wingers properly from any kind of meaningful conversation and, and and McManus in this way works as kind of I mean a gatekeeper is sounds a little pretentious because He's not really gatekeeping us from anything, but but he's he's there to sort of go through the motions of looking like he's handling the right wing intellectually, even though I don't think he really addresses many of the core complaints about the right wing. And you know, I, I could go through the conversation very very briefly because I think it's it's kind of fun to rehash these things. By the way, for people who are interested, Todd Lewis from the Praise of Folly podcast and his co-host. Uh, they had a wonderful write-up on their Substack. I, I, um, maybe I can include that write-up in the description after this, uh, after this uh, uh, podcast airs. I forgot to actually get the link. I, I think they also did a live stream rehash of their reactions too. Usually, I'm very negative on sort of after-action reports from people who didn't participate in the conversation itself, largely because 
they, they give you sort of tactical pointers like, oh, you should have brought up this at this point, And that would have been a slam dunk. But that's not how, you know, in the famous words of Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan until they get hit in the face the first time. Debates aren't like that. There are organic back and forth. So you have to make decisions and retroactively thinking, oh, well, I should have paused here longer or no, I, I paused here way too long and it looks like I'm beating a dead horse. These are prudential decisions that you have to make on the fly. And so, you know, and, and, and sure enough, I'll admit right up front that when I had my conversation with McManus, the point of it was to go through it and and really cover a variety of different topics, not to sort of catch him out or twist the knife. Because I understood, I suspected that if I twisted the knife, the conversation would end very, very, very quickly. And this is, um, this is something that... Uh, I, I um, pardon me, my phone's ringing. <laughs> I, I wanted to have sort of a longer conversation where I could draw him out and actually see how his mind reacted to certain critical issues. Uh, this is something that I think, but, well, maybe I'll go over the conversation a little bit because, you know, Todd Lewis and his co-host were, were good enough to do this, but I'll go over it as well. Um, we, we covered a variety of topics about how the left wing planned to make the world better. And what you kind of discover going through all of this, and the, the real key points here, I think, were drug and pornography use and, and labor markets and, and family formation and, or subsequently the, the decline of family formation. And sort of the motivating example I had on my side was, well, I grew up in an area. I, I didn't grow up in San Francisco, but my mother was born there. So, it, you know, it was kind of a, a, a hometown vicariously to some degree, right? You go outside in San Francisco, in an increasingly large amount of the city, and there's just people who are killing themselves. There's an out-of-control crime rate to the point where large areas of the city are not operable for business, and this is one of the, some of the most expensive real estate in the entire United States. People are moving their base of operations to the East Coast because of this at this stage. Whole operations are closing down. People are moving out of the city. This is completely out of control. And, and it's been, and, and there's no political opposition. And and this is, you know, the question is like, why are people killing themselves of drugs? Why, why do we have these problems? Conversely, why do we have this problem with family formation? After 40 years of the left essentially calling the shots when it came to, sec when it comes to sexual culture, when it comes to stigmatizing certain behavior, when it comes to actually prioritizing what's valuable for a family and what should be celebrated, why after all of this do we have declining marriage rates, declining family formation, and a decreasing amount of mental health, especially seen in people who are raised in more progressive communities? You know, so you listed all of these problems. And again, if you want to watch either the conversation between myself and McManus, it's on the channel, or if you want to watch Todd Lewis's rehash of it, it's on the Praise of Folly channel. But what you kind of get in McManus's logic, and I, I knew I'd get this, I, I let him do the majority of the talking, is you kind of get this, this, this strange daisy chain. So the immediate solution to the drug problem is to essentially institutionalize homeless people in rehabilitation centers where they can't leave them and go use more drugs, and then take the drugs away from them until they're clean, and then essentially try to rehabilitate them forcefully through work, through essentially being forced to go cold turkey and by treating their mental illnesses inside institutions like we used to do in the 1950s. That's the immediate solution. The immediate solution to crime is enforce the crime rate. But Mac Mac McManus rejects that on liberty grounds. And this is another thing you discover, right? You discover immediately that socialists or modern academic socialists like Professor McManus they're libertines first, and they're socialists second. The whole Heidean idea, the idea by Jonathan Haidt that progressives are predominantly motivated by care harm considerations, in my opinion, is transparently bullshit. Uh, this is this is something that uh, you you see kind of come up, especially in the crime and homelessness examples. Matt does not want to increase discretional policing or essentially to institutionalize homeless people who are killing themselves through drug use. He wants to establish ways that they can use drugs with less stigma and consequences through free needle clinics. Despite the fact that these clinics have been piloted in places like Vancouver, which is another place that I have a lot of experience with, for decades, and the problem's only gotten worse. 
but this is this is the solution because we have to respect the liberty of the drug users themselves. We have to respect the liberty or, or the autonomy of the African-American community not to be over-policed. And I can't put enough scare quotes around that, that phrase, over-policed. So instead, what we have to do is we have to tackle the root causes. So what are the root causes? Well, according to Matt McManus, the root causes are a decline in spiritual family formation, uh, sorry, a decline in spirituality, a decline in family formation, and a decline in community, and a lack of economic opportunities in the form of jobs and in the form of low wager, labor costs and high housing value. Uh, well, that's that's great. That's great. Uh, so, I mean, just just let's just go down that line of causality and, and just take a step back. So, what's the solution? to the family formation problem. Are, are we gonna confront the incident of high-speed dating, the, the do-it-yourself pornography culture, the pornography culture generally that's just flooded into the mainstream in the last 20 years and has a measurable, different, a measurable impact, a measurable negative impact on people's ability to pair off and meet people? Are we going to try to encourage a marriage culture where we stigmatize people for not being committed and actually treat people entering into marriages as a priority? Well, again, we hit a problem. All of these, these possible solutions are straight out on liberty grounds. We cannot confront anything in terms of pressuring people to get married, in terms of actually having a marriage culture that looks like something that's remotely traditional, or even taking away OnlyFans or fighting pornography or fighting AI pornography, which is soon to be coming online. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it already is online, although in a, in a very nation form right now. A new drug's coming online, and you know, we have to let people do this because it's it, even, and this is sort of a, a very key takeaway from our conversation, even if there's a total decline in family life, even if everything I'm saying was true about the use of, of pornography, negatively impacting the formation of families uh it's still not worth it uh to it's still not worth it from a liberty ground to actually restrict the use of this stuff instead the only thing we can do the only thing we can do is we have to be able to um we have to be able to we, we have to confront the economic circumstances behind this if women are using women are making only fans that means they must not have enough jobs or men aren't providing enough. That means men then need more jobs so they can afford houses. So you go back to that problem. And that problem immediately comes down to the fact that there are too few jobs. There are too many people in these large cities and not enough houses. And both of these things are being driven by trade and breakneck high-speed immigration policies, which both boost the cost of housing and diminish the cost of labor. Okay, well, can we fix that problem finally? Have we finally arrived at a problem that we could potentially fix through action? No, we can't increase the cost of labor by restricting trade and increase it and decreasing immigration because, because that's, that doesn't confront the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is capitalism. And out of all the solutions for capitalism, the best I could come up with was worker co-ops and unionization. Um, th this is what, this is what you, you kind of realize in all these conversations. And, you know, th this is something I probably should get off of this, this topic because it's not really what I want to talk about. I was just kind of uh, shooting the ship before I could talk about my main topic uh, during this stream. But, but, but it, it's, it's fascinating because, again, I know that these are the answers for most socialists, but to see how it kind of plays out in real time is, is very instructive. What actually causes Matt McManus to take an emotional step back and what, what causes him to feel uncomfortable? Because when people start to feel uncomfortable, when they start to feel like they're, that something personal is going on, that's the point where you know you have them in a place where they might reconsider their opinion, where they're struggling with things, where their humanity is exposed and where there might actually be common ground. So, so you could go all throughout these policy questions from, from one end to the other, from abortion and pornography to drug use to crime to, to immigration, free trade, and capitalism and the Nordic model. There wouldn't be a beat. Matt McManus was totally on a script. And it's a script that, that seems like it has a very, very important purpose. The important purpose is to take temporal problems 
that we see and that could have solutions right away and transport them into completely theoretic, uh, theoretical problems. So suddenly the very real problem of me walking outside and stumbling over a person killing themselves with fentanyl or my personal problem of seeing an enormous cohort of my own classmates not getting married and not having kids, and for many women in my age, that will mean never having kids, kids at this stage. The, uh, my very personal problem was seeing entire communities transformed through having their jobs being taken away, or mass immigration making them virtually unlivable by high housing costs. All those very temporal problems by the end of the entire dialectic are fit into this nice, neat, tidy box called capitalism. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a problem. We've gone again from temporal problems, real problems, organic problems, to capitalism, which is a, an entirely, entirely theoretical problem. And capitalism has only entirely theoretical solutions. It's not something that you can actually solve. It's something that will always be in the process of, of being solved. Just pardon me. I'm still getting messages from OBS. This is a little irritating. So you can, you can, you can, or, or he, for instance, he doesn't understand the idea of supply and demand in immigration with, with respect to immigration and housing. So there's all these little macrocosmic things that are ridiculous. But the most important thing, sort of the key takeaway I got, was just how he thought about these problems. Every, every, you know, the way he answered my questions too. Every time I asked him a very direct question he would drop a bibliography on me. So, so I'd ask him, you know, this came up in the conversation too, I asked him about whether he actually was a Christian, uh, whether he, he, uh, he, he believed in the Nicene Creed and, and the actual bodily resurrection of Christ. And he gives this really, like he gets uncomfortable and he gives this really wishy-washy answer. And then he immediately, one second later, he launches into his vision of Christianity, and he goes to like Paul Tillich and existential Christianity and the roots in Stoicism and this progressive Aristotelian and blah 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 blah, and then like and all of this this entire bibliography uh, about his particular vision of Christianity and how it contrasts with Zizek's idea of a materialist Christianity. Um, all of this is is. is I mean, and then that's where he gets confident again. He gets confident when he's, he's unfurling the bibliography. He gets uncomfortable when he asks to answer the question, did Christ ask, actually resurrect from the dead? Are you comfortable letting a, a homeless person kill themselves? Are, 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 are you comfortable letting someone's child kill themselves with heroin rather than send them to an institution? Are, are, you, are, are you fine with, with standing by while our cities completely rot away due to out-of-control labor policies and immigration policies? Uh, those are direct questions. Those are hard questions. Those are questions that Matt struggles with. The theoretical ones, the ones about uh, abstract things, uh, well, those he immediately launches in. It's like a fish to water. As, as, as soon as the answer is something that involves a bibliography, Matt McManus takes off like a, you know, a race car. Whenever it goes back to values, positions, physical realities, he slows down and gets confused. And this is, it's kind of an, it's kind of an amazing feature of, of all of this. Is you know, and this is obviously what people criticize me for is is they wanted me to really slow Matt down. They wanted me to laser focus on one topic, so I would force him into multiple admissions, looking at one issue microcosmically. The problem with that is that a Matt McManus did not want to do that. I, I would have had to literally force him to do that because he did everything to digress away, and it wasn't really my style to kind of twist the knife because I wanted him to keep talking. But, but you know, the, the learning and sort of the personal enrichment that I got out of this process was, was seeing how, how I, I really think just the entire academy takes on these questions. And this is true for people like Ben Burgess, too. And we're going to talk about another person like this in a, in a few minutes, you know, probably the subject of this stream. Uh, but the, the, and this is the thing, it's also weird because we engage on Twitter a lot because people keep on, I, I kind of, I muted Matt McManus so I wouldn't be tempted to, to re-engage with the conversation after our debate because I think it's a little bit poor form relitigating things, but people tag his name in, 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 in my tweets. So 
I ended up a few times going back and forth with him. And I keep on going down. I keep on going back to one thing. I keep on going back to one thing. And like, what are your basic values and your basic beliefs, your organic experience of the world? I can't believe he does not understand what I'm looking for. Because every time I ask him this question, like, what are your organic beliefs? What are your basic beliefs? The things that you're actually engaged with on a real world space. He cites ideas from John Rawls. Like, like my core, my organic belief is the belief in John Rawls' original position and, and, and utility for the least among us. That's not an organic belief for several reasons. First of all, it's literally somebody else's idea. It's literally an idea that you couldn't have come up with yourself experientially or in community. And no two philosophers will have the same answer to that question. Uh, it, it's something also that since it contains things like least and greatest and original position, these are hypothetically abstract words that don't have any clear definition or meaning, which is why, again, philosophers completely disagree with it. It also means that it can't possibly exist in the real world. Uh, the, the homeless junkie who's killing himself on the street by taking heroin, that's a real person. The, the, the least privileged among us is not a real person. It's a hypothetical construct that you built for yourself and that you've constructed a, a, as an endpoint for a progressive philosophy. You can use the, the good for the least among us as, as an excuse to do what's worse for the people who are right in front of you, who you understand better. And, and that's obviously the fear with all of this hypothetical stuff. The first one is that no two people agree on it, so there can never be any action. The second one is that that the that 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 uh, there there is no ability to really operate in an intuitive space and in, and in a realistic space because you have no real empathetic connection and I hate that word because left's totally corrupted it because you have no actual connection to the thing you care about you don't really care that the problem's not being solved all you care about is that your solution is the right solution. But it doesn't matter if your solution is the right solution if the problem's not being solved. If your son dies of a heroin addiction or if your friends can't buy a house, that is a real problem or start a family. That's a real problem. And Rawls' original position is not going to help you with that. And moreover, debates about the meaning of these things can't help you about this. And I, I don't know. I think our, our society kind of trains people to, to think this way. And it's not like progressives don't have actual basic beliefs. They do. When they talk amongst themselves, when you catch them in a moment of passion, what they're really passionate about is this idea that they're part of an ongoing civil rights movement, that they're on the right side of history. The part where I really felt that puff up when he was talking about the heroism of being part of the pro-gay marriage movement in in the 2000s, which, you know, for anyone, the uphill battle to get marriage legalized for gay people. Man, if, if gay marriage was an uphill battle, and if you thought gay marriage was an uphill battle in the late 2000s, early 2010s, you have no idea what an uphill battle is. Uh, at that point, all of the rock stars were making songs about how they were for gay marriage. All the media was on your side. It was a fait accompli. Everyone could see it coming. But, but you could see, nonetheless, you know, lost, uh, fait accompli or not, lost cause or not, the, the heroic struggler or not, I should say. You could see that this was, this was where the passion was. The passion was the idea that they were, you know, a warrior for justice. I and mean, they should have kept the word social justice warrior because it did accurately describe how they saw themselves. The point of, you know, their primary value is that it is themselves as a product, is themselves as, as sort of a warrior in social justice. Their relationship is, is, is an activist one, and it's to continue on the form uh, continue on the form of the civil rights crusade and, and to be a part of the thing that makes America better. It doesn't matter that equality isn't achievable. It doesn't matter that a specific policy designed to achieve create equality is manifestly killing people. All that matters is that we are the people we were waiting for. We are the people that's going to put this into effect. And, and, you know, my ability to think about these things and my ability to 
sit back and ruminate and, and read tons and tons and tons and tons of theory and process it and spit it out in these I mean, that's one of, that's actually, I'm kind of impressed that Mac McManus can take a simple yet snow question and, and spin out five citations before he answers yes or no, and then never answer yes or no. But that, I mean, that's what he's good at. He's good at ingesting large quantities of text and spitting out bibliographies. And, and, and the idea is, is that social justice or the civil rights movement, the same thing, uh, you know, woke, wokeness, it's all, it's all part of the same movement. We all know it is. No one wants to call it anything because whatever you call it, progressives will deny that name for it. The, the whole point of this is, is, is to portray yourself as a part of this good system, as a part of this good ecosystem, as a part of this religious body. This is, this is the, the progressive equivalent of the body of Christ. And the, the, um, that, that is where his passion lies. It's an institutional relationship. Uh, this is why the question of the whole DEI thing uh, doesn't make sense. I, I brought up this a few times. I, I actually didn't know how they'd react to this because these stringent DEI requirements are more or less a new thing. So when I started my channel, they would have sneaky ways that they would get you to kind of profess allegiance to diversity. Uh, they, they might put a questionnaire saying, do you have any idea how this might impact uh, underrepresented groups in a positive way? It, it was portrayed as something positive. It was portrayed as something that would help you. You didn't have to answer it. This is how things were in 2015. And, and so until really 2020, the progressive line on the DEI statements was always to deny their existence. It was always to imply that, that, that these kind of statements of ideological loyalty were a conspiracy theory invented by Mount Walsh uh, to, to besmirch an otherwise completely ideologically neutral institution. Uh, that's no longer the case because now everyone can see them because they're no longer implicit. There's no suggestion that they're, op uh, they're optional. Universities have DEI departments that make these mandatory requirements, and these DEI statements are typically on, on college applications and on grant applications, the first thing that you fill out. And, you know, I can remember personally spending an enormous amount of time trying to come up with, with bullshit re reasons why I'm, I, I, I've written like three unsuccessful grant proposals. I suck at them, which is one of the reasons why I'm not in that business anymore. But, but I, I remember spending an enormous amount of time, and my field has nothing to do with politics whatsoever, uh, doing ex exogenous research, trying to show how hypothetically uh, whatever my machine learning project was, it would have a positive impact on some protected community, like some LGBTQ, some person, of, uh, some POC, some, some, uh, some African community might benefit from, from this totally unrelated theoretical research. And now it's only gotten more and more formalized. And so I kind of was curious how they would react to this. And of course, Mac McManus steps around. Oh, of course, that's the universities. Everyone knows the universities are biased. He's part of the university. And so every time I brought up, he'd step around it. And, uh, you know, on Twitter, when, when these people tag me, I brought this thing up again. You know, they, they start, of course, whenever things get a little bit thorny for them, they start dropping academic credentials. They start referencing how they, they're, they're peer-reviewed academics. Uh, well, dude, guess what? Your peer review is 100% guarded academically, ideologically. Uh, you couldn't get into a peer review position over these people without agreeing with you politically in the chief ways that distinguish us from you. Uh, so, so why would I trust a peer group of people who all have to sign statements saying that they have a certain given ideology, which you're here advocating for, and now invoking it as a means to, to prove that somehow academics are all on your side? And and this is this is the, this is you know at that point Matt McManus like his chatbot resets his sort of uh, his sort of um, clever response uh, co copy pasta runs out and he usually just goes silent at that stage, but strangely enough his, his colleague I, I don't know their associate acts his colleague Ben Burgess, his solution to this is why why don't you just lie. And this is what's really amazing to me. I mean, and, and then he says, well, later, just, just try to talk around the topic. If you're, if you're in a field 
where where this where where the, this is unrelated. Just just talk around. Just make up you know make up bullshit. You know, he asked me, did you lie? And I said, no, I, I didn't lie on these grant applications. What I did was just kind of insinuate things in the background that sounded like they could be plausible without directly lying. And he's like, okay, cool. You didn't have to lie to get your grant application approved. Uh, and. It, it's amazing. I, I I can't really even countenance people like Ben Burgess. It, it seems like he doesn't have. There's something about his religious perspective, and I think everyone has religion, that that does not that that's not offended by lying. That's not offended by just being a weasel, and and, and constantly living a Potemkin. I mean, you're an ac presumably, you you enter into academia to pursue the truth. You, you enter into academia so that your thoughts cannot be restricted. Otherwise, you just work in industry and make more money. <laughs> but but somehow, constantly having to ideologically lie to appease the commissars, uh, me complaining about that is is whining. It's whining. It's just it's it's just it's it's whining because man, bro, if you really cared, if you had the cojones, you would just belly up to the bar and lie to the commissar about what you truly believed and bullshit your way on all your grant applications and, and just go through the system, man. Just go through the system. Just lie. It's not that hard. Um, <laughs> I I don't know. I it's it's it it feels to me sort of like these people are playing a game. It feels to me. And I think Matt McManus is, is certainly less aware of this than Ben Burgess is. I think Ben Burgess is aware that all of this stuff is past its expiration date, that there are very few true believers, and, and that the role he's playing is, is sort of is, he's sort of he's sort of come in under the radar. Uh, these guys are white guys who are working in academic departments who are doing everything in their power to hire absolutely positively no more white men. And the reason why they're trying to hire no more white men is they're transparently trying to reach a quota. And their quota for white men is all filled up with boomers and Xers and older millennials who got in before the DEI requirements properly came into effect. And so they're all stocked up on old white guys in the era of Noam Chomsky. And believe me, the political science and philosophy departments and linguistic departments, in the case of Noam Chomsky, don't want any more of them. And so Matt McManus and Ben Burgess kind of are aware that they're on borrowed time. They're aware that this stuff, that this, that, that this institution they're participating in is indefensibly ideologically biased to a point where they would have absolute objections to it had it occurred in, in a context that disfavored them. But they also have this, this, this strange understanding, or at least Ben does, that, that if there weren't these ideological requirements keeping more honest people out, he probably would have been outcompeted. <laughs> there probably would be a lot more people competing for his position, and there would be a lot less opportunity for him to be prominent. And so they have a strange sort of symbiotic relationship with this stuff. They have sort of a strange type of, of symbiosis with this institution. They, they know it's completely mendacious. They know it, it's completely subverted its original, its original ideas. Uh, but they have to defend it. They have to participate in it. And, and they're offended. They're offended that after all of this, there are people who are trying to subvert them. And what does this tell me about progressives generally? I, I don't know. I don't know. But it, it tells me to a large degree that 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 you you want to talk to the man, not the progressive. Because the, the progressive the progressive themselves are a list of answers. You know, to speak more to the point I was, I was going over previously, one of the super chatters in my conversation with McManus asked the professor, well, how can I be expected to interact with the academy when it's so clear that they don't want any more straight white men? And McManus goes, well, I'm a straight white man and I had no problem, you know, entering the academy. And, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, Matt, you, if you want to get into the academy, you have to have exactly your opinions. Your opinions are what allows you to operate in the academy. Your exact opinions on all of the issues that matter or are relevant in contemporary politics, you have to have the exact opinions you do. You have to be a liberal. You have to support trade liberalization policies, perhaps with a progressive spin on them. Oh, it's real free trade this time. You have to be open borders. You have to be... <laughs> You have to be for uh, for decreasing discretional policing. You have to be before all of the social issues. 
everything is a completely pre-prepared institutional response. There is no wiggle room. I mean, there's wiggle room for the theoretical stuff. There's wiggle room for how you set up your specific bibliography. If you prefer Rawls or Aristotle, if you like Zizek, or if you prefer Judith Butler, do you like Michel Foucault or do you like Marcuse more instead? You know, the specific esoteric philosophers from 40 or 50 years ago, those can change. The reasons can change. But the conclusions, the basic beliefs, all have to be the same. It all has to get back to supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the panoply of different liberal policies that basically control our economic system macrocosmically uh, and, and prevent it from moving in any direction other than the direction that it's already going and other and sort of... Uh, it, and you can support socialism for some time in the future. You can support the Nordic model, although I'm still not clear how Canada isn't the Nordic model yet. It seems to me that Canada absolutely is the Nordic model. I don't see what's really different about it. Um, are there social programs not? I mean, I get, they'll probably say the social programs aren't generous enough, but but some of them are more generous depending on how you count it. Uh, but, but 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 either way, your your radical opinions have to be hypothetical. Your theoretical opinions can be diverse, but they all have to come down to the same basic beliefs, and the same basic beliefs are totally institutional. They cannot change. Uh, you know, and this is something that, that that people scoff at. That that Matt Matt thinks that theory is where it's at, and that these sort of pronouncements, the things that come out afterwards, are are superfluous. But that that's the exact opposite. The most important things are, are the basic questions. That, that you see and interact with on a day-to-day -day time frame, on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. Uh, the real things are, 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 the, are the spiritual professions you feel in your heart, the, the relationships you form, the, the, the ethical constraints that bond you to other people. Uh, there's this great meme where people say, you can still be on the left and be a capitalist. You can still be on the left and be a communist or support a different marginal tax rate. But you can't be on the left if you have any divergent opinions about race, sex, gender, or any of the other identity group politics. Therefore, identity group politics is what it means to be on the left. And that meme is absolutely right. What, what, what really defines us and what is actually the, the driver of our ideology are our basic beliefs that we develop through intuitive understandings of the universe and experiences with people and relationships relationships with people. These become principles when they are felt as lived constraints that we have both interpersonally and with the organizations that we interact with too. So, you know, my Catholicism becomes real with my prayer. My Catholicism becomes real with my church attendance, with my marriage vows, with me marrying another Catholic woman, with me baptizing my child, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's these things that become, that, that are the real things. Uh, my belief in Thomas Aquinas' just war theory, or my opinion about the teleological nature of Augustinian theology, and how it compares to the theology of Thomas Abelard, and how that in turn compares to the theology of Paul Tillich, that, that's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it's useful. It helps you think about, it helps you come to the world with a new set of eyes. It helps you re-experience things with, 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 with new ears and new senses so that you can sort of hone and sharpen your basic beliefs. But what drives your behavior in the universe are these simple things. And they're also things that, that you expect to have reflected back on yourself. You expect to have the community in large, say these beliefs back to you. And you don't expect them to have different definitions. When I say, I believe in one God, and my wife says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I want us to all be thinking the same thing. I, I don't want, you know, half the people to be thinking of Thor and half them to be thinking of some esoteric Gnostic God. And then, you know, there's a few Orthodox Christians in the margins on the epsilons. Uh, that's meaningless. The only meaningful nature of these things is when they're felt, when, when, when the symbols actually point to a common belief in substance. And the same thing is true of racism, right? You know, when, when the left says that they oppose racism, they mean this as a basic belief. They actually believe that. Uh, they actually believe in John Lennon's Imagine. They actually believe in the society that's been cleared out of all particularities and, and that is now 
uh, and that is now free for total liberation and the total realization of, of individual des desire. Uh, they believe in, in that, and, and that's why when, when they require you to make statements affirming diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, there is z zero wiggle room. And if they feel like you're trying to do some kind of hat trick where you say you want diversity and what you really mean is you want to preserve ethnic groups in their own individual nations, they will totally suss you out. They will go on a witch hunt. They, they will find the heretic and they will kill you and, kill, and they will boot you, right? And maybe they'll kill you at some point, right? And, and you know, people don't realize this too. Ben, ben doesn't realize this also. If, if I'm an outspoken conservative, you know, and I have a Twitter account and I'm tweeting out all these opinions about how I think diversity, equity, and inclusion are bad. And then I write a personal statement for my DEI uh, requirement on a college application to become a professor there. Uh, the, the DEI representative on the admission committee is going to suss that out. Uh, they're going to Google my name and they're going to see that I don't agree with their version of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then they're going to tell all the other members of, of the uh, admission committee that I misrepresented myself on my application. And they might not care about DEI, but they'll care about me lying. And, and then that will be obviously a no hire. If you, if you lie about some belief on your application, that's an easy reason to discard an applicant. Div Progressives care about DEI. That is a basic belief. That is, that is something that they experience. They're embarrassed about it. They don't really believe it in their heart of hearts. They wouldn't die for it. But it is the animating act of belief that moves progressives. The vision of the John Lennon imagined society. The, the call to be part of a new civil rights movement. Uh, your election to a meaningful role inside that movement. Your participation in activism. That, that proves that you're one of the good people, the elect, the anointed. That's what they actually believe. Those are their basic beliefs. They can't say that because they're embarrassed about it. They can't say that because that belies that the entire academic pro project they're engaged in is sort of fraudulent at some deep level. And this uh, finally brings me back to a little bit more of the, uh, of the main thing I want to talk about in this lecture. Um, and uh, the, this, this is the James Lindsay meltdown. Now, I, this is a little bit of a story. Um, I, I, the, I want to talk about the James Lindsay meltdown and, and I'll say right up front, I'll just give people a rundown on what's happened it is James Lindsay essentially has completely left any pretense of being right wing conservative or conservative aligned. Uh, he's gone, he's been going on and on and on about Twitter on Twitter about how the, the real enemy is conservative Christians. Conservative Christians are going to lose anyway. All people who, who like reactionary ideas or who reject the liberal enlightenment, they're going to be crushed by a giant backlash. And this is what's really silly about the James Lindsay meltdown. You know, usually prophets of doom are wise enough not to conclude specific dates that, that are very near in the future. James Lindsay has promised that in the next two months, all of conservative religious politics are going to be completely not uh, nullified, in his words, by, by a backlash of, of LGBTQ activism in the wake of, in the wake of, of Pride Month. And um, man, <laughs> and of course, because this is James Lindsay, every single time someone responds to him with a serious question, he calls them names and, and, and runs away. And... Uh, I don't really know what there is to say about this. Uh, the thing is with, with this, this James Lindsay is I, I have no idea why James Lindsay uh, is. I have no idea like why he's a thing on the right. Uh, he, he his, his work is really derivative. He essentially, again, is like this bibliography generator. He doesn't bring any intuition or any insight into, into topics. He just kind of debunks them. And I did a little bit of reading up on Jim, uh, on James Lindsay for this conversation, for, for, for this lecture. And of course, I prepared this in like 20 or 15 or 20 minutes. So the, the preparation is pretty minimal. Um, yeah, I, I, and Charlemagne's answering the thread. I did read the Yoram Harzoni's thread. And Yoram Harzoni, uh, he, is, he is a Jewish nationalist and one of the people in charge of the NatCon conference. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, this is, 
he, he gave sort of a, a thread about what's going on with James Lindsay. And, and James Lindsay has essentially determined that the only, it, it, this is another thing, James Lindsay also declared a few days ago that this moment we're experiencing now, this is the, this is the second enlightenment we're experiencing. It's the new marketplace of ideas. From this moment forward, all ideas are going to be open for debate. But will he debate Paul Godfrey? Oh, hell no. Will he engage with any Christian nationalists? No way. Will he talk to any neo reactionaries? Uh, go soak your head. Of course, but no, but it's totally, it's totally free. It's totally free. I just, I'm just not going to debate with any people I disagree with. And it's, it's the new enlightenment. That's what the new enlightenment is. It's, it's me and my cool liberal friends talking about how we can own the Wokies who themselves won't platform us in any meaningful way. I didn't really, I wasn't really aware of James Lindsay's background, but the first time I saw his face, I immediately, there was another name that popped into my mind, which was Peter Bergoshin. Now, a while back, about a decade ago, or a little more than a decade ago, I was living in Portland, and this is just when I had come back to Christianity. And so it was funny because originally when I was an atheist in college, I was really into the God debates from the atheist side. But in the early 2010s, I was now re-engaging with these debates from the Christian side. Now, I was all hopped up on all this apologetic stuff, which is you know, virtually meaningless for the, for the reasons that I, I, I've been talking about. You know, this is not properly addressing the question of basic belief, uh, of, of, of sort of the organic place that we take to things, and, and it's, it's, it's focusing on analytics. And, and I come across this, you know, in Portland, the, the debate circuit between theists and atheists is dominated by this character from Portland State University, I believe, called Peter Bergosian who looks and acts exactly like Bill Murray's character from Ghostbusters. He's, he's basically the Peter Bankman of science. I, I, he's basically the Peter Bankman of philosophy. I keep on wanting to say, back off, man. I'm a philosopher, <laughs> right? He has, he has this kind of like, uh, you know, button down, like uh, late in life, silver fox character who's kind of a charlatan, but, but is sort of a little bit too full of his own intellect. And, and he was obsessed with, with this kind of, with, with his idea of street epistemology, of arguing people out of their irrationalities. Which, you know, I mean, for anyone who's tackling this question seriously, like Jonathan Haidt, he should be entirely skeptical that people would, would, would sort of engage in some kind of dialectic argument. Um, and that, yeah, this is another good thing that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll digress. The whole point is to digress. But uh, people don't engage look at people do change their mind and in some sense conversation and dialectics does help people change their mind but they change their mind through a process of of examining their core basic beliefs and 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 their basic loyalties and shifting them slowly over time 99.9999 percent of the time when there is a core political disagreement it is a core disagreement in values not a core disagreement in terms of our calculations or in terms of how we apply logic or in terms of how we weigh evidence in a Bayesian way. Uh, this is why arguing people out of, uh, of positions is, is, so, is so futile. Most of the time what happens is, you know, most of the time when people have sort of, and I really think that the, 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 the cognitive dissonance proper is, is actually a very rare experience. Well, most of the time when people look and they see obviously contradictory worldviews, what's actually going on is that people have core axioms that they're embarrassed to admit. And because they're embarrassed to admit, they come up with a story about how they came to the beliefs that they have for other reasons, because they were told that it's inappropriate to have the reason for believing uh, the thing uh, like they do, right? Uh, e either they're convinced that one of their axioms, one of their core moral beliefs would be considered socially unacceptable, or they believed it would be considered hypocritical or immoral, and, or, or they think that the methodology they have behind the reasons for their belief would be considered improper. A great example like for this would be, again, you know, the early 2000s atheist uh, theist debates, 
which were meaningless, first of all, because the atheists never showed up with actual theological arguments. They just showed up to bash, bash the history of Christianity and the morals of Christianity. And, and second of all, because the Christians did come with apologetic arguments when it was very, very obvious that the Christians did not arrive at their views through apologetic means. Nobody discovered Christ by, you know, they were perusing the library, looking for logical arguments to put into their logical processor, and then they picked Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theological Logica off the shelf. Uh, they read it meticulously, translated it into formal logic, they checked the mass three dozen times, and discovered that, you know, God belief was required by them by the rules of logic itself. That never effing happened. That never happened. Nobody came to the belief that way. And so most of the time in these conversations, you know, th this happens a lot with progressives too, with, with their sort of cognitive dissonance. It's not a good thing. It's not happening and it's good that it is, right? Uh, what, what progressives really believe is, uh, you know, so, so you'll do this with something like Drag Queen Story Hour. Well, th th first of all, they'll say, it's not happening. And then you show them that it ha is happening, and they'll say, well, no, it's good that it is because it's appropriate. Then you show pictures of people being totally sexually inappropriate, and then they move on to the idea that, well, some people have taken it too far, but it's liberty. But this is just part and parcel of living in a society with a lot of weird people who make bad decisions, and we can't punish them for it. And, and people present this like it's some deep illogic or it's some deep dishonesty. Uh, what was actually going on is that the, the, that the last position is their actual position. The, their, 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 their deep and abiding basic belief it is a belief that the, the, the human soul it, it experiences itself, it experiences transcendence and holiness by being in a state of absolute possibility and choice. This is sort of the end point of the Faustian vision of mankind that, that Spengler lays out and that the authors of Faust themselves lay out. They, they believe that the act of liberty itself is, and optionality, is itself spiritual and holy. And that we, we have to preserve this liberty as a state of holiness, regardless of who suffers from it. This is the Matt McManus, I wouldn't ban porn, even if it cratered families and sent people into drug addiction. I still wouldn't ban porn, uh, even accepting the hypothetical. And that's because the idea of liberty and freedom from, from constraint is literally a religious basic principle for them. And they're embarrassed to admit it because they have utilitarian ethics. The utilitarian ethics are bullshit. The utilitarian ethics are the apologetics covering up for that basic spiritual experience that's guiding them in their way. And so, and, and progressivism is a story about how their libertine view uh, of a humanity without constraints living in John Lennon's Imagine it, it is sort of, it's a justo story for how to produce that. And that's what causes the embarrassment. And, you know, there's this, you know, I hypocrite points this out too. He he did a debate review among another progressive who had just the cognitive dissonance about drag queen story hour that I'm I'm talking about right now. And in in, in, in a very, very spicy move, uh, I hypocrite compares this appearance of cognitive dissonance with uh, the appearance of cognitive dissonance pointed out by some Austrian painter in mid-century Germany, who pointed out that there was another group of people who would experience cognitive dissonance uh, with their own interests. Uh, look, guys, it's not hard to explain here. What's, what's going on, and I, I, I don't really agree with the mid-century uh, Austrian painter. Uh, it, it, when, when people have cognitive dissonance like this, when, when groups of people argue and they concede the point in public because you have the better argument, but then they revert back to their original position, that means that the position you defeated in public was not their real belief. That was the only belief that they could admit to publicly. They, they, they were embarrassed about anything else. What was very, very likely going on in the case of mid-century Germany was that people honestly believed that their peoples were the best and that they had a right <laughs> to, to be rich. And, and they were pursuing the interests of their own group. And when it came down to it in public debate, they had to present their own group interests as being for the interests of the body politic in general, because they were too embarrassed to say in public, no, 
I believe that my group, I should fight for my group first and foremost because that's my primary loyalty. This is a core problem with humans being fundamentally dishonest, and I'm afraid dem democratic institutions only encourage this dishonesty. It's not something special about any given group of people. All people are tempted into this very, very understandable human flaw. Uh, and and it, it's very true in the case of progressives these days because their institutional positions rely on them maintaining the myth of liberalism and the myth of progressivism. We have sort of two gods that are dying simultaneously. And you can see this is true in sort of the James Lindsay meltdown. Now, James Lindsay, he's very much following in in the pathway of, I guess I already mentioned Peter Burgosian, right? This The street epistemologist, the guy who's going to argue you out of all your silly notions like God belief or wokeism. A few years ago, Peter Burgosian submitted a bunch of crap papers to social justice or woke publications in cultural studies and got them published anyway. And he, you know, he did this little end zone dance showing how, how he could get them to publish absolute gibberish, not realizing that Alan Sokol had done the exact same thing 15 years ago and nobody cared. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Peter Burgosian still believes that the Academy works like this. I believe Sam Harris understands that it doesn't. Sam Harris and James Lindsay and Peter Bergosian, they're kind of like the previous iteration of, of the Matt McManus and Ben Burgess types. Did I say something else? Sam Harris. Did, did I say something else? It's Sam Harris and Peter Bergosian. They're, they're the previous iteration of the Matt McManus and Ben Burgesses. The Matt McManus and Ben Burgesses realize that they're in their position because they pursue social justice. They are there because they have the the morally right positions that fit into the DEI regimen, and they're able to make very, very good apologetics for the religion of DEI, <clears throat> and they're there to kind of be the debate me bros for that side. Their institutional relationship and their adherence to that institutional relationship are their primary things. However, when we go to the more Gen X side of things, the Burgosians, the Harrises, and the Lindsays, they're in very, very invested in this idea of the progressive as an avatar of liberalism, as an avatar of open discourse. The problem is, is that this idea of open discourse was never very strong and may have been a myth all along. It may have been a myth the entire time. And everyone's big in, 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 in the wake of and the real the real threat to, of wokeness is not so much that it threatens to ruin the careers of Peter Bergosian and, and Sam Harris and and James Lindsay. The the real threat of wokeness for them is that it exposes the system a, as a transparently ideological engine. And people are going to start asking themselves, how long has this thing been ideologically biased? And the answer to that question is not going to be, it all started in 2008. <laughs> and before then, it was a pristine marketplace of ideas. And the reason why secular liberalism won was because it just had the best arguments, the best apologetics, the, the biggest brain people. Uh, the, the thing is, is that the reason why James Lindsay and Peter Bergosian and Sam Harris are where they are it's because of hegemony. It's not because they're super geniuses or they're they're so studied or they've read the, the the pages thoroughly again and again and again. It's certainly not because they're very compelling writers. They're actually kind of all three of those guys are actually very boring writers. They don't really have anything interesting or or or, or, or inspiring to say to people. They're more or less just doing a paint by numbers rehash uh, of intellectual ideas of de debunking things. And the only reason why their sort of new new atheist stuff, their new atheist shtick works, is that they're the null hypothesis. Sam Harris debunking everything works only if the worldview of Sam Harris is the default worldview when all other ideas have been debunked. If Sam Harris can argue from the position of of nothingness from the view from nowhere if the sam if the sam harrises can make arguments from the view from nowhere and then just have the reigning ideology of the modern democratic po party rule or just have the ideology of the gen x academy rule that's all they need 
if they need to get into actual conversations about what grounds their moral beliefs, then everything falls apart. Because it's transparently clear at this stage that, I mean, I should maybe give people some background information. What really set James Lindsay off on this rant about how Christianity and Christian nationalism and all traditional religious forms of politics and awareness are going to be obliterated in three months and how neo reaction is going to be completely destroyed in two months. What set him off on this rant was his ridiculous idea that the, the way to solve the woke dilemma was to separate the LGB from the T and the Q and the LGBTQ alliance. Uh, yeah, so basically, essentially arrest the moral arc of progress just at the point that would be comfortable for James Lindsay. Uh, arrest the process of leftism just at the point that benefits those people like James Lindsay to the maximum amount. This is transparent hogwash. It's transparent hogwash for, for a few reasons. Uh, the first one is that it's, it's very obvious that the logic for the trans and gender queer stuff and, and the 3,000 different, uh, different gender identities that arise from these more queer notions of gender, it's very obvious that the arguments used for gay marriage and any other number of deconstructive uh, attacks on institutions like marriage and, and divorce and adoption, it's very, very obvious that these are the same emancipatory arguments for individual liberalism, and that the same arguments can be used against Lindsay as were used against the Family Research Council. The second thing, you know, the second reason why this is a problem is that there's sort of an obvious fallback position that might be tempting for James Lindsay to use. And that is, at this stage, it's very, very obvious that things like transgenderism, and, and gender queer lifestyles and really progressive lifestyles overall are incredibly unhealthy. This has been something that a lot of research has come out very recently on this, but the, the mental health crisis is predominantly a progressive or leftist phenomenon. And the more leftist you are and the more educated a leftist you are, the more you're suffering from this mental health crisis that has seized the professional classes of the West in the last 15 years. And, and, and it has a huge comorbidity with all of this LGBTQ stuff. Now, you, you would think that you now there would be sort of a fallback position argument that James Lindsay could make. And that would be the argument that, well, you know, the, the, gay, the gay marriage and sort of the, the, the social norms of 2007, that was the, that was the last healthy state. That, that's, that, that the sexual marketplace was in. This was the last place we had in American history where men and women could still pair off, where you could still have Judd Apatwa movies, where, where you could still imagine the American family continuing on you know, with, with a few allowances cut for, for gay people to have their own version of this two-parent two household, the way that Andrew Sullivan sold conservatives on, on the idea way back in the Atlantic Ma Monthly magazine in, in the early 2000s. You know, you, you could conceive of it stopping there on pure health grounds. But, but the problem is, is that that doesn't work either because, because it's really, really apparent that, that the Judd Apatow, Dan Savage, Judd Apatow, Dan Savage view uh, of the emancipatory but nonetheless somewhat wholesome monogamy it is totally uh, unstable. It's totally degenerate. It totally collapses in on itself. It, it doesn't form families. The millennials that tried it did not have proper family formation in nearly the same way that their parents did. And, and it inevitably leads to situations where a very small number of men take the majority of women and oftentimes, in, in, when they have power, abuse those women. Uh, so what you have is you have an entire generation that's disillusioned with this post-sexual revolution answer to these questions. And, uh, and, um, and, and they rightfully want to tear it down. And, and, and simply arguing for this being a good solution is, is not working anymore. So uh, the, the James Lindsay meltdown is... I don't even, I get, I, again, I have no idea what this guy is actually given the time of day on, on the right wing or whatever made him popular. I mean, I, again, I, people actually give me 
crap. I mean, you know, we had the the, the Matt McManus picture and the Lindsay, uh, the James Lindsay picture. Uh, people think that I'm pick probably at this point think that I'm picking goofy pictures of these people like to, to make fun of them. Uh, you know, these are literally the pictures that they put out. Uh, the the pictures I, I pick from Matt McManus are the most recent pictures they have on their on their Twitter profiles. And this is, you know, the 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 most recent picture James Lindsay released of himself, looking like like this dorky thirty year old guy. Like he looks like a, he looks like a seventeen year old on his way to prom or something like that. I, I don't know what what's wrong with his face. He, he looks like this eternal. He eternally looks like someone else's son. There's there's no maturity or solidity in that face. And, and and the expressions don't help him either. I don't know what it is about 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 this process. Uh, but 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 the the real thing and the real takeaway the, to the James Lindsay thing is you have to know when you're arguing against an institution. And in the case of James Lindsay, you're arguing against an institution. There's a certain type of person like James Lindsay that cannot exist in the reality of, of 2023. He has to come to terms with a, a variety of very difficult truths. And, and that really forces him to be honest about his basic beliefs and his basic interactions with the world. And and I don't think that that's possible. And, and so I, I think really, you know, the, the same thing is true for Richard Hanania. Uh, Richard Hanania is, is another one of these characters. He's, he blocked me. Uh, because I I, I I disagree with his, his statistical analysis uh, of what leads to wealth. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I should be, people say maybe maybe I shouldn't criticize the baby face and, and the beard so much, but I don't think I have very much of a baby face. Uh, certainly not like James Lindsay. I think we're, we're roughly the same age here. Um, also, oddly enough, I think we both have technical degrees in, in non-philosophy subjects. Uh, as well, so there's there's another sort of uh, you know similarity there between our biographies. Um, the the James Lindsay, <clears throat> the the thing with James Lindsay is this is a generational problem. We're we're going to have to help people like James Lindsay work through this. I don't know how we're going to have to help them work through this, but there are a whole class of people for which we need to have hard to hard conversations with. About, about a variety of things, starting with the fact that people, by and large, cannot make decisions for themselves rationally and do not make decisions for themselves rationally. The human marriage market cannot be run through rational means. You can't have a bunch of academics get into a room and discuss economics. And moreover, corporations and... and um, and big conglomerations of power, are, even if they're individually organized, do not act like uh, like um, uh, like individual actors. And I'm going to get into that in, in my last subject of conversation. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, you know, people are, are, are they, they really go after Yarvin. They, they really go after um, the old neo-reactionary sphere. Because in many ways, a lot of their recent answers to a lot of things have seen a little bit disconnected. They're not really at the cutting edge so much anymore. And they've made a number of predictive mistakes that have been kind of silly, especially Yarvin on, on this front. Uh, and they've used a lot of sloppy analogies. But but they're, they're valuable because of, of this cast of people, the, the James Lindsay's of the world, the, I hesitate to say, the Adam and Sitches of the world, uh, the Peter Burgosians of the world, the, the Weinstein brothers of the world, there's a whole group of white men, to not to mince words here, that are addicted to this idea that the most important thing about them, the most important thing about their identity, is their ability to, to do logic really quickly. That, that you, you walk into a room and the reason why your ideas are really, really good is because you're just this really, really great language and logic processor. 
you you have a really you have a really good ability to to shovel in huge quantities of language and spit out bibliographies and then go through all those bibliographies and condense everything down to its formal nature and then and then gel it and, and point out all the little contradictions that arose from this bibliography and then and then pick the solution that has the least number of contradictions or that that most accurately aligns to our data driven understanding of the universe that is not what is actually going on. That is not what defines you as a thinker. That's not what defines you as a man or as a soul in this universe or even the wisdom of your responses. What defines you and the wisdom of your responses, and, and I sound like a broken record here, it's an intu first of all, it's, it's a moral understanding of the universe, which is born from intuition and experience. It's an intuitive approach uh, to, to weighing data and it's a combination of that intuitive approach of a weighing data and, 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 and propositions with, with an experience of the universe that you test it against. Uh, this is what makes older philosophy uh, so generative and so important. And this is what makes modern analytic philosophy that's detached from reality so stupid, so facile, so pointless. When, when you interact with Plato... When you read Plato, the most important thing to do is to sort of come into communion with how Plato saw the world, with the wisdom of Plato, with how it was like to, to experience, well, I mean, it's Socrates because Plato's writing dialogues uh, with, with Socrates. So you could just as easily say Plato, but you're getting Plato's ideas through those dialogues too. But but the, the point is, is that you're, you are interfacing with a living mind on the other end of history. And the same thing is true for Hegel. You read Hegel, nobody understands Hegel. And certainly nobody is formalizing Hegel. Every you know, Put four Hegel scholars in a room and you get five positions. What matters about Hegel is coming to an intuitive understanding of what these concepts he was dealing with meant and then integrating his, you know, the wisdom he brought through his deep knowledge of history and his brilliant mind to bear on your own situation as a human, living in the world, making decisions, building alliances, coming up with friend-enemy relationships. That's the point of doing, that, that's not the, the entire point of doing philosophy, but that's what really people really get out of doing philosophy. And, and, and this, this entire notion uh, that, that, that it's a marketplace of ideas, that, that we're, just, we're just really, really good natural language processing robots, uh, this, to my mind is nuts. And, and, and I think that, you know, we have to make a space and it's important to understand that, that, that really what we are trying to do is we're trying to help people get past this. What, what people need to understand is that analytic ability is good, but what really matters is you be, you being able to tell everybody, what do you value most? What do you really believe in? What sets your soul on fire? What, brings you a feeling of transcendence what gives you purpose who are your people who are your people that's a great question right there no philosopher would have had a hard time answering that question hegel could have answered that question bertrand russell could have probably answered that question although that's kind of cutting it a little bit close to modernity but you know hegel could have answered that question burke could have answered that question de Maistre could have answered that question Socrates and Aristotle certainly could answer that question. <laughs> Marcus Aurelius could have answered that question. No modern progressive can answer that question in any meaningful way that it's all real. That's a bigger problem. That's where the conversation has to begin. Because if I don't know who your people are, if I don't know what your faith is, if I don't know what you value, what you fight for, uh, what, what, what is actually animating your emotions and your intuition... I almost feel like we shouldn't bother to bandy data points or, or to, comp I mean, if you, if you literally want to break out the Excel sheets and look at the data tables and, and slap expressions into R or just plug it into chat GPT and see what pretty graphs chat GPT can generate before its own ideological conditioning can kick in and nix that in, in, in the bud. But, but most of the time, you know, if, if you were to imagine humans as AI, you're not even interacting with their, their logic and data processing modules. You're just interacting with their moral engine. So what you have to start with is laying your moral engine cards on the table 
And that's the one conversation that above anything else, James Lindsay does not want to do because he's too embarrassed to admit that he has one. He's too embarrassed to admit that he has specific things that he fights for that, that cannot themselves be justified through data and through rationality. He can't lay his axioms on the table because he's embarrassed about them. The same way that, you know, certain groups in the mid-century were embarrassed about saying, yes, I fight for my people. Of course, I believe my people are the best. And it, it, the, the great tragedy is, I believe if people were just honest about this and they said in no uncertain terms, you know, what they really fought for, I think there would be less fighting. <laughs> I think that if, if, if Joe Biden stood up on the podium today and said, you know what, this war in Ukraine, it's just about NATO expansion. We want to make sure that the CIA has a certain amount of credibility. We want to show people that we can really throw down with Ruskies, that Afghanistan was, was just a fluke and that we can, we can, we can win a good old fashioned war. And we, we don't care a toss about Ukrainian sovereignty. We don't care an iota about about who rules, uh, about who rules Eastern Ukraine or the Russian speaking regions or whatever. And Putin can just say, I just want to reestablish the Russian empire. You know, that would be something to talk about because if, if those were, and that, that, if that, if that honesty was there, then, then you could, you could meet in a little treaty of Westphalia and some Swiss guy with a protractor and a pencil could, you know, he could like that famous Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry routine where they're dividing up Europe and drinking tea and, and being fops and the, the original treaty of Westphalia. And you could have the, the, the Swiss version of Stephen Fry, you know, divide up Ukraine into little provinces and hand them off to each empire. And then, and then thousands of lives would be saved. We wouldn't be on the brink of nuclear war. If we could have an iota of honesty, we wouldn't be on the brink of nuking each other. Trading, you know, trading fighter jets and soon bombers, launching raids into into Russia in, in reckless ways, in ways that would thoughtlessly provoke. And of course, because Putin's lying to his own people about the fact that this is about, I don't know. I mean, you can listen to P Putin's propaganda and it's more or less the same thing. This is about our sovereignty. That's actually probably not propaganda. We all know the State Department wants to color revolution Russia. But you know, this is about the dignity of the Russian people that I care about deeply. This is about you know drawing a line in the sand for the independence of the provinces uh, that we're currently destroying with the fighting. You could just dispense with that and have two princes negotiate new Brent boundaries and no one would have to die. But since we have to go through all of this idiotic enlightenment democratic rigmarole, where people can't just be honest about what they actually want, uh, it, it makes the it makes the fighting worse, not better, <laughs> and it's 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 tragic. All right, well, so the last thing I wanted to get to um, is is uh, is uh, our our little boycott season. So this is the last thing, and it, and it kind of well, maybe it's not the complete last thing. But but it but it ties into you know the the pretense and and so of course we are entering the holy month of Ramadan for the LGBT community. Rainbow flags are going up everywhere. People are doing more trans advertising, and of course the left is taking a step forward. Now it's taking a step forward in a very unusual situation, and that is it appears that Red America has pulled off a successful boycott of Bud Light. Now. So as everyone knows, what, uh, Bud Light did a very prominent marketing campaign with Dylan Mulvaney. What was the, it was about almost a month ago. And so a lot of people from the Daily... Uh, oh, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I need to put the entropy link in the description here. Um, let me just do this right now because people are complaining about it. Um, but Dylan Mulvaney did a very prominent um, ad spot with... Uh, Bud Light, which is essentially an extension of Anheuser Busch, and you know, in, in a completely boneheaded move from a marketing point of view, Anheuser Busch decides to essentially screw over their main demo and and signal against all the people who actually buy their beer, thinking that Red America doesn't have the cojones to fight back. And this is, of course, typically this is a good marketing move because the purchasing purchasing power of middle class America has steadily declined over the last 20 years. They are no longer a demo that anyone wants anymore because they have less and less money. There's fewer and fewer and fewer of them. And they have they have increasingly small amount of political power to get what they want. 
Moreover, people want to change their brand so that they can appear woke because they incorrectly believe that this will sell, sell beer, which it probably won't. But more so because uh, more so there's sort of a perverse managerial incentive because being seen as a woke CEO is a very good or a woke vice president or a woke vice president of marketing or a woke senior manager is a very, very good move for you at or a very good move for your career as a managerial professional. So maybe not the best for but or Anheuser-Busch's profit line, but really, really good for your prospects at getting a job as a CEO if you're a vice president of marketing, to be seen as a woke executive because boards of directors hire for that because they like the publicity, because they're publicity-sensitive creatures too. They're political animals as well. And, and so all modern CEOs, all modern managers want to be seen as a progressive CEO, and, and so they'll make moves in this direction even if it runs the risk at, at running over one of their key demos. Moreover, on the con on the converse side, no one wants to be seen as a conservative CEO because that will, in the same way, jeopardize your ability to get new jobs. And Aaron McIntyre had an article on the Blaze that the details this very very beautifully, in, in the classic managerial language. This is something that we've known for a very very long time about managers and managerial uh, fads. But this creates a big problem for for Anheuser Busch uh, in the short term because. Their, well, for Bud Light in particular, their demo is really, really angry. It feels personally insulted. And they have a boycott that's currently costing them a lot of money. And there is, you know, I, I think that the purpose of modern companies isn't only to make money, especially if you assume low interest rates. And in periods of low interest rates, your company doesn't need to make money at all because it could just borrow more as long as it's growing in market share, as long as it's growing in prestige and being seen as inevitable. It doesn't matter if it's making money or not as long as there's low interest rates. But now interest rates aren't so low. And, and so losing a lot of money is, is not a very good thing for Anheuser-Busch. And so now they're caught between a rock and a hard place because the thing is that they can't. They can't move right. They can't give in to the 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 republic the the non woke mob, because first of all, that in order to give in properly, they'd have to throw their executives under the bus, which would mean that Anheuser Busch would be seen as a worse prospect for future ambitious talents. So if I know that Anheuser Busch fires people for being woke, and being woke is my only ticket to sort of make it to the tippy top by getting hired by other companies' boards to be their CEO, then I'm not going to want to take the risk by working for Anheuser-Busch. They also know that they could suffer legal ramifications if they do an anti-woke counter signal because wokeness is literally built in to human rights. It, it, it's, it's literally built into civil rights law, into employment law, through the institution of human resources departments and desperate impact. So they're completely caught between Scylla and Charybdis here. And um, this, is, this, is, this is the problem. This is why uh, what, what we're going to see coming up in, in Pride Month is that far from, far from learning a lesson from Bud, uh, from Bud Light, far from learning a lesson from Anheuser-Busch, all Anheuser-Busch's competitors like Miller Lite and Target, you know, and, and, and other, uh, you know, every other corporation, and not just because of Pride Month, double down and double down hard on all of their Pride Month stuff. Why did they do this? Because they wanted to break the boycott. Because it's better for their business model right now to, to break this boycott than it is to pay out or, or get the immediate payout by absorbing the losses. that. But, so, for instance, if Miller Lite just decides to go anti-woke and capitalize on Bud Light's loss, it will get a payout in the short term. But what it will do in the beer industry is create an anti-woke standard, which means that the entire business of beer making will be under increased risk of lawsuits, from disparate impact claims when they signal in an anti-woke direction and hire executives that are anti-woke. It'll also be harder for executives that have to make anti-woke statements to get jobs in other companies 
and they'll stick out like a sore thumb when all the other companies are signaling their adherence to the ideology of the ruling regime of the time. All of these things are bad for their business model overall. It's bad for their class interests. It's bad for their class's power or their caste's power. And corporations, although they probably don't care about the substance of wokeness in particular, they're very, very aware that it only that that if there is a culture war, if there are some companies that are woke and some companies that are not woke, that will cost their entire class more in the long run than if all of them are just uniformly indistinguishably woke in the exact same amount all at once. And so this Pride Month, they're going to double down because it's in their interests to put the kibosh on it, to break the resistance. Because if they get boycotts, if people think that they can boycott any one of them, they're all going to go down eventually. They're all going to suffer huge losses. This, If the Bud Light boycott works in actually getting people fired, in actually getting a, a, an ideological concession, then that boycott will just be the beginning to a larger culture war that will cost them billions upon billions upon billions, if not have legal consequences for its advocates. Now, um, this is this is something, there's this really stupid movie from the, the, the late 90s called The Civil Action with John Travolta. It's about a chemical spill and the variety of companies that cause this chemical spill. And like most late 90s movies about corporations, it's very, very pretentious. It kind of looks down. It doesn't try to understand how corporations think. It just sort of wrings its hands about how evil they are. But, but in, a, in sort of a, a moment of, of understanding that's uncharacteristic of the rest of the movie, the CEO of the corporation guilty of having this chemical spill sits down with John Travolta and, and talks to him about uh, payouts. And he says, look, I don't really care about how much money I have to pay because, you know, settle, settling these lawsuits is just something that I do as CEO. I don't feel guilty. I mean, I didn't personally spill the chemicals this is just i just represent the company that did it's just a job for him right but he says the thing that i'm very concerned about is for the general perception to be that my company can be sued for anything it can be sued for any case of cancer that happens in the vicinity of one of my plants that any company is liable for anything as long as somebody has a sob story so I need to keep the quantity, you know, to an acceptable level in order to not so much stop me from paying a lot of money, but to stop the future signal being anybody can come and just wreck havoc on our business model. Not just for me, but probably for other people who are working at other companies, which might be me in the future, because as a CEO, I get hired at other companies all the time. Uh, and and that's, that's very much the thinking. Going into this Pride Month, you, you, you have Run America really feeling their oats, so to speak. Uh, they think they're going to wreak havoc on these corporations. Uh, I don't know what to tell them, really, uh, because the, these corporations, um, uh, they're going to hold a line. Because if they don't, uh, if they don't, like I said, Bud Light will just be the beginning for them. And uh, the, the idea always, from Matt Walsh's point of view, was the whole, you know, the whole tombstone thing where there, you know, Wyatt Earp has got five or six guys and he has the gun on them, but obviously he can't shoot all five of them. And, and they say, well, we all got guns on you too. We'll just draw. And Wyatt Earp's like, sure, but when you guys do draw, I'll shoot you, the leader, right? So you might get me in a rush, but I'll take out you, Ace. The problem here, uh, you know, from, from the tombstone analogy is that you don't have an ace to shoot. Uh, there, there's no leader that, that you can threaten with a consequence that you can impose on them. There's not going to be a dead body from the Bud Light boycott. Uh, there's just going to be, um, there, there's not going to be, there's not going to be a lesson learned. There's not going to be damages that are, that are internalized as a consciousness, nor is there a leader that's going to be thinking about his own skin rather than, um, <clears throat> uh, rather than uh, a, a just, just sort of a general sense of class interests, I should say. And, and, and so, you know, 
obviously, you know, what's going to come out of this? Is this going to be like what James Lindsay says? Is this going to be the beginning, beginning of the end of all conservatives and right wingers? This is the ICBM that's, that's, that's going to be launched at all reactionary forces and destroy them? Hardly. The future is reactionary. The future is right wing. It is not, you know, if mankind has a future, if mankind has a future, that future is right wing. There's no question about that. And because the future is certainly not James Lindsay. The future is certainly not Matt McManus or Ben Burgess prattling off predigested talking points, the only ones he can, and is launching bibliographies into the ether, ignoring the manifest degeneration and destruction around you and not helping it because you have a theory about how something might happen in the future with capitalism and socialism. The future is not that. The future is right wing. You know, what, what, what is, what is the, the reaction to this? And, you know, I think that we can learn about this. And the right response I had, I heard, was from sort of one of my Twitter mutuals, Juniper Tree, which I see in the chat now. And she was, um, she correct, this is actually a very female, I, it wasn't, she wasn't the first person who told me this. I think my wife said something about it wasn't this particular boycott, but it was a, it was one previously that that the, the most important thing was to see these kind of products and think that they were yucky or 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 not cool. And, and this is really the 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 point the, the the correct use of the boycott. And I I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing that Red America boycotted Bud Light because Bud Light is low status beer. And if you drink Bud Light, you demonstrate to everybody that you have low status. It's And it's literally yucky. I don't know what to say. You know, I, I used to be an IPA hipster. I'm not going to lie. Right? There's a, there, th that, that's, that's, uh, that is what it is. And, you know, <laughs> although I prefer sort of wheat beers, you know, I, I prefer things that are a little bit smoother uh, these days. But I mean, I, it's not, it's not good beer, right? It's low status. If the result of the Bud Light boycott is that Red America realizes that the symbol of Bud Light is their own subjugation, that will be an achievement. If they realize that Bud Light signals to everyone else in the society that they're low class, that will be an achievement. And the same thing is true for Target. I think that was Juniper Tree's original example. And the example for Target is, you know, they they hired this ridiculous graphics artist who apparently literally is a Satanist. I mean, this stuff, it, it's so, they're not even trying anymore to pretend that, they, that they're at all friendly to, to, to n normal values. And this graphic artist designs things like a guillotine pins about how they're going to execute everyone who doesn't approve of homosexuality, which includes all conservative religious believers of any variety. And, you know, of course, the, the standard sort of trans stuff. Uh, that these people designed and are now launching in, in, in Target stores. And Juniper Tree's response was, the, the way that you fight back on this stuff is um, is not to say, is not to indicate that it's politically incorrect or that it's it's gay or, or that, you know, it's something that we're, we can boycott out of existence. Uh, the way you fight this stuff is to indicate that it's low status, that it's uncool. That it's something that you, you wouldn't be seen in in Target apparel because that's I mean maybe I shop at Target but I'm kind of like ashamed of it it's kind of a dirty product it's something you know I was kind of slumming it when I was shopping there you know I we knew we knew that we were in financial straits because we were caught shopping at Target it's something that people shop they shop at Target because they have no respect for themselves. That that's the kind of attitude you want to 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 garner. This, of course, is also the attitude that that modern that will not modern, but that that subcultures in the 1990s had towards mainstream products. Think of Naomi Klein's Naomi Klein's No Logo movement and all of the grunge stuff. You know, you 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 wore Vans Vans jeans and 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 old Converse shoes from a thrift store. Because if you bought store bought stuff at the Gap, that would be kind of gross. It would be kind. Of, it would. It would be. It would, it would betray a sort of a non aristocratic attitude towards these things. It would. It would be. It would be kind of beneath you. It would be dirty. This is the attitude that people have to kind of take to these things. 
not to demonstrate you're not going to be able to break these corporate conglomerates or boycotts, but you could establish for yourself a separate practice. You know, find a new beer that's made by people that you actually like, that you can drink with pride. And take, take pride in the beer that you drink. Take pride in the clothes that you wear, even if they're cheaper clothes than the ones that exist at Target. Even if they're hand-me-downs. Red America has to stop thinking negatively and more positively about what actually represents it. And, 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 and actually be able to answer. I mean, this is, the, this is another product of the 1990s that's sort of uh, um, the, uh, the, the everyone in Red America, and I don't think this is true previously, they were convinced through marketing campaigns in the 90s, very much like those by Bud Light, that, that certain corporate products represented their own ethnicity. The NFL, Bud Light, corporate country music, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, Ford trucks. You can see that like, you literally have brand names dumped into country songs. But every time they sort of adhere to their appreciation of one of these products, they get further and further and further away from sort of the theme of, of this entire <laughs> uh, podcast or this entire uh, episode, which is what are your basic beliefs? What are your values? Who are your people? What are the things you do that represent that? You need to have internally as the thing that stands closest to your ego and closest of your understanding of yourself, your core beliefs and your core understanding of the community you belong to. The, the products you buy, I'm not going to say that they're detached from that. They certainly aren't because buying and trading is a core part of what we do. It always has been. Production has always been part production and consumption has always been part of the human animal. But you need to come up with a story that's believable about your relationship to this product. Maybe you're in a tough position and you have to shop at Target or these woke brands and you can't afford to go to a brand that's slightly more expensive. And that's fine. But the story is we're in a tough spot. We're shopping at Target. Not, I'm a proud Target mom. And, and, you know, I think this is also true of a lot of Christian cultures is they like cute stories about themselves doing things that usually involve corporate products. Take a page out of Naomi Klein's handbook. <laughs> the stories can be about you and the products, but you got to take the logos off. The logos are the mark of the devil. You do not have a relationship with Bud Light or Ford. You have a relationship with cars. You have a relationship with having, well, doing tailgating. I mean, what do you use Bud Light for? Certainly not drinking at a restaurant. Usually it's for tailgating because you can drink a lot in the hot sun without getting massively dehydrated or, or drunk before a game, right? So you define yourself by tail, having a good tailgating party. You define yourself by, you know, being a, a savvy shopper who can who can get all of the the coveted products. But the brand is forever and eternally your foe. If it's a woke brand, maybe you have to negotiate with that devil. But always keep in mind that your core basic principles, your core intuitions, and your core beliefs are primary. This is sort of the thing I'm trying to turn into a meme is this 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 image of Lorgar, the arch villain of Warhammer 40,000, the, the person who messed everything up and, and who, who destroyed humanity's chances for any kind of peace. But he was also the only Primarch who really understood the true nature of war. And the true nature of war is that wars are wars of belief. First and foremost, and this is one reason, you know, why women are political animals. If war was about politics or war was about war, uh, then, you know, women would be in some sense entirely unpolitical or, or entirely ancillary to the process of politics. Uh, but they're not because women are not ancillary to the concept of religion and the concept uh, of wisdom. 
And, and, and right now, more than anything else, what Red America needs to understand is the core beliefs that bind it together and that set it aside from from the false projects of yesteryear. That might make that might mean having to emotionally make breaks with the old world in ways that people just aren't comfortable with. But that's where we are right now. And, and if you don't answer the question about what you truly believe, you are not going to be able to meaningfully fully fight a, a political struggle against your enemies. And here is the thing. Here, here is also you know the 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 little diamond that's in in the rough, the little piece of hope that lies at the bottom of Pandora's box. If you're able to describe your core beliefs in, in, in basic terms, in authentic terms, in organic terms, you can do what all of these left-wingers and these, these false sort of liberal posers like James E. Lindsay cannot do. You can speak authentically about politics. You can testify about what you're experiencing, about what you're seeing, and you can build communities of trust that you actually trust. Matt McManus can't really trust other leftists. He has to trust the institution. James Lindsay cannot properly communicate about what he values. He has to trust the mythology of liberalism. But when Christians and other religious believers, to a lesser extent in my belief, but I'm not going to dwell on that, when we say we believe, what we are describing is an actual living presence an actual living religious practice, an actual relationship with sacraments, an actual relationship with an eternal spirituality that exists, always has existed, and always will exist. And our communities are not some hypothetical statement about the least well-off in society or, you know, Rawls's original position or this, this, and this about, about utilitarianism and mill. Our communities are based on actual relationships of trust, actual bonds of blood, actual bonds of adoption, actual bonds of marriage, actual relationships and religious practices, and actual oaths towards communities and political projects that we believe in. (laughs) It's very obvious what James Lindsay believes in. He believes in dialectic he believes in his own intelligence let's be honest it's very obvious what matt mcmanus believes in he believes in eternal liberation eternal emancipation he believes that he himself is the intellectual endpoint of the faustian project and the faustian project can continue but the faustian project is not continuing the faustian project is dying but god will not die. Christ was here before the Faustian project. Christ will be here after the Faustian project. I am almost certain, and I am absolutely certain that God will be here after the Faustian project has long since died. And uh, with that, I guess I'm going to end tonight's spiel. Oh, one last thing, one last thing. There was another thing that I saw that I was originally going to talk about. Uh, There was this amazing NatCon conference, and it was was really a study in this. It really was a study in, 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 we're doing, first of all, I should say, and and I'm going to do an official announcement video next week, Um, but uh, we are coming up on the Sildings conference which is the weekend of June the 23rd. It's going to be in Tennessee near Nashville. uh, And I encourage everyone who wants to participate in our community to attend. Aaron McIntyre will be there. Uh, Charlemagne, myself, a variety of other really good speakers will be there. Talk Oh, uh, Radical Liberation. Mr. Carson will be there. He gave an amazing talk last time. And, you know, this, this, Again, it, it will be. It is cer- cer- a certain financial obligation, obviously, to attend. But but this is a way to get very very invested in a community quickly. Friendships are born there. Your connections with other communities are forged there. Basket weaving communities become something that are more uh, prominent 
So it, it really is very, very good if you're looking to become more involved in the activism and take the next step forward. So so there's that. But 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 without tuning the my own horn or the, or the horn of, of the Beowulf Foundation and the Old Glory Club and, and Seldings uh, USA, I, I will say that uh, I, I did see the videos posted from Europe Marzoni's National Conservatism Conference in Britain. And what was very, very interesting was two things. Uh, first of all, there were basically two conferences that went on in the same convention hall. The first one was a, uh, a sort of rehabilitation project for washed up Tories who had absolutely nothing to say and who people, you know, they gave the perfunctory claps, but no one really, really cared about that. And they're obviously trying to ride the coattails of something that feels more vital. The second conference that was going on was a conference about how it was basically twofold. It was an admission that the paleocons from the late 90s were essentially right about most everything, <laughs> about almost everything. And of course, I think Theodore Dalrymple, who's one of the original, who was one of the original uh, pale, British paleocons, actually one of the only British paleocons other than Peter Hitchens that I can think of off the top of my head. He was giving a talk at that conference too. Um, but but what, what was really interesting is you saw sort of this old guard immediately meet up with a variety of female speakers who represented the new guard. And, and the common theme throughout all of this conference was pronatalism is the banner for which the wisdom of of the of the neo of sort of the paleocons uh the, the populist insights that were brought into the mainstream or that were brought to the attention of the mainstream and discarded in the late 90s these truths these insights can be brought to bear for a larger audience under the banner of pronatalism we are the people who carry about the who care about the continuation of the human race the health of the human race and subordinate to that larger cause, the health and continuation of our own individual peoples with their own cultures and their own faith traditions and their own homelands. And, and, and for this reason, we have to come up with a new political consciousness. And as Alex Kashuda very much pointed out very well in her, her own talk at the National Conservatism Conference, uh, this is going to have to involve bringing into the foreground certain uncomfortable truths that we've known were true for a very long time, uh, which will be at least things like talking about HBD, human biodiversity in a real way. This is something that I think in particular Christian communities have to work to get over. You don't have to be a spurg about this stuff. I am not because obviously God's love is universal and God's dignity is universal. And there's no two humans that have different values. They are all the same eternal value in the eyes of heaven. Um, but, but we still need to come to terms with reality about, about how group dynamics works, about how societal dynamics works and about how this intersects with, with certain projects having to do with civil rights and mass immigration and and, 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 th and this conversation begins with the very true observation that a lot of Christians have been bringing up recently, that in many ways it's the people who think that that it's, it's in many in many ways the assertion that HBD is heretical is a denial of faith itself because it says that somehow uh, biological diversity defeats God's love, which is itself a heresy. In order to come up with a new vision for humanity, we have to assert both that human groups can be different in their own ways and unique in their own ways and worth preserving in their own ways, but at the same time have a universal dignity that can be fought for on the international scale. And that our banner, the banner of, of, of pronatalism, the banner of national conservatism, is the banner of the entire world, the good for all people. Mass immigration, breakneck speed mass immigration helps nobody. It is not a poverty relief program. These people will be better helping out their own countries anyway. 
and a single dollar, a single pound, would go further to relieve poverty in these people's home countries than it ever would sitting it, collecting dust in the coffers of, 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 of all of these NGOs working to bring people over and pack into high-density cities that were never meant to hold these people to begin with. This is the new consciousness that's emerging on, this, on, on the international stage very, very quickly. There's new energy here. And, and it's in handling these sort of dicey questions that is going to be the job of the distant right going forward. This is going to be a major talking point at the Sildings Conference this summer. It will be a main job of the various different right-wing commenters online. Myself, uh, Aaron McIntyre, Carl Benjamin, uh, so many YouTubers I can't mention them, people I have on the show all the time, uh, and, 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 and developing new societies that can operate through, I think, what, what we're seeing is really the death throes of the liberal world order. And that can preserve some kind of semblance of themselves with the death throes of, of, of the liberal world or, order. That will be our key deliverable. And this is, again, why I emphasize basket weaving so much and why I think it's so important. Uh, but that being said, guys, that is absolutely the end of my spiel. <laughs> Two hours this time. Uh, that's what you get for having no preparation. And I will now pause it for Super Chat intermission, and I'll be back in one minute's time to uh, go on and take your super chats. guys welcome back uh so now i'm gonna change modes here get rid of the powerpoint and i'm just gonna pray to god <laughs> that uh that the um the pinning function on obs is now working again because i reset this up earlier today oh my god it's working that's amazing um okay so i i imagine uh, uh, thanks guys this is now the second part if you think these things are too long if, you, if you're one of the many, many people who complain that my podcasts are too long, you can just end at this point and take a little two-hour podcast. But for now, until at least midnight, I will be answering super chats uh, from the audience and uh, hopefully getting some good questions in. So for $15 USA, I know CPR. Nietzsche said that nihilism would be the high culture for the next 200 years. And from my analysis, he's right. From Judith Butler to Blood Meridian, high culture believes in nothing. Do you think a Napoleon Ubermensch fills the void after the Republic collapses? Is the left's fear of fascism valid? Um, so I know CPR. I've been on the record many times about this. I do not think that... Pardon me. I do not think that a Caesar-like figure is in the cards for us. What I think is going to happen is I think that there are going to be a variety of regional leaders. There might be some kind of Napoleonic figure that seizes the reins internationally for a time being that will probably come out of like the World Economic Forum. But he'll only succeed by ignoring the emerging leadership that emerges in regional areas and not starting wars like the State Department is, is doing right now. It'll be his, his job will be to declare peace with with various different regional rulers that have that have the ability to get business done in their own special areas so i'm, I'm imagining something a lot more like the mary of Indian rulers than i am something like caesar that being said i i think it, nihilism cannot be an animating culture it just can't because there's no substance there animating cultures have to be driven by core beliefs 
And nihilism is a view from nowhere. Nihilism is functionally what people are trying have been trying to do for a hundred years. Uh, they've been trying in, in in modernity and now in post modernity. They've been trying to come up with the perspectiveless perspective, the valueless value, the anti teleological teleology. It just doesn't work. And you know, it's funny you bring up Cormac McCarthy because I think this is much closer to what's going to fill the gaps. Cormac McCarthy in Blood Meridian, you know, is that nihilism? Cormac McCarthy is a Christian. But what all of Cormac, uh, to my knowledge, he is, someone can correct me, maybe they'll tell me that he apostatized or something like that. But at least when I, when I heard of him, he was a Christian author. And what, what he deals with is the silence of God. That, that is what all his works kind of embody, is a, a sort of a belief in spirituality in, in, a, in a mode of decline, in, in, in a world that's rapidly disintegrating and in which the norms of society are being consumed by chaos. And all, all of Cormac McCarthy's heroes uh, or, and villains, his villains are representations of that chaos, whether they're Anton Chigurh or the judge from Blood Meridian. And, and his heroes are kind of people who witness this chaos consuming the world around him and have to navigate through, through this, this, this time period. Uh, and and, and that, that very much is, I, I think, Blood Meridian... I think No Country for Old Man is very much a representation of what future fiction is going to look like. But but I think that that is really a perspective of an implicit and hidden God rather than something that is nihilistic. I do not think that that represents nihilism at all. I think it represents sort of a, a primordial uh, understanding of God. It, in some ways, it's a more primal understanding of God. I know CPR for three dollars USA. You mentioned on a previous stream that Christianity will look like Dostoevsky's Christianity. Can you expand on that? I've tried to read him, but dense fiction is difficult for me. Uh, sure. So that's not me saying that. That's I believe I'm I'm going to get this wrong. I believe Spengler said that he believed that the civilization that would replace Faustian civilization. He believed it would be some kind of organic Russian civilization that would believe in the spirituality you saw blossoming in, in Dostoevsky. And, and I, I very much believe that something like that is, is coming. And, and I think that you know, the spirituality... And, and Dostoevsky, he definitely does... You know, he definitely is um, somebody who finds God in sort of these spaces where we're ordinarily nihilism seems to be rampant. I mean, Crime and Punishment's the classic example of this. It's obviously criticized for having an overly happy ending, but the story of Crime and Punishment is, is a person sort of living in, in sort of this totally chaotic existence, uh, literally sort of preaching nihilistic Nietzschean ethics, and then him coming in contact with, with a supreme moment of reality uh, and then him dealing with the fact that that sort of his theory is is, is sort of not basically he discovers a, a greater spirituality in that process and I mean uh, the Christianity that we embrace in postmodernity has to look more like a theology of Dostoevsky and less like a theology of Joel Osteen or a theology of apologetics. This is the great mistake of evangelical Christianity, is that it was trying to be triumphant. It was trying to justify itself. It was trying to, it was, it was trying to play modernity's game. What, what makes sort of Dostoevsky's Christianity, what makes a Christianity that's sort of implicitly there in the background of Cormac McCarthy novels so powerful is that it just is. It, it's basic. When, when I say basic beliefs, I, I, I need to kind of maybe develop this concept a little bit more firmly. I, I, in many ways, I'm, what I'm saying is axiomatic, but what, what I'm also saying is that it, it, it lies very, very... Uh, it's not something that lies on top of some formal analysis or three dozen observations of data. It's something that you have come to value because you have a deep intuitive understanding of, that this is valuable in the universe or, or you have, have a, an experience that's taught you that this thing is, is valuable. 
for, for early Christian believers, this experience was either the literal resurrection of Jesus or through contact with disciples who had witnessed it, uh, witnessed the resurrection of Jesus, or who were close in time and who, who witnessed to it through their own actions, through their own incredible actions, through their own witnessing as saints. And the the sort of key app, and I hate using that horrible Silicon Valley term, but that's just the, what's closest to mind. The key virtue that we have that our enemies do not is we have an ability to just live authentically and be authentically and hold ourselves in a way that it's very, very obvious that what we're talking about is something that we actually believe. You cannot betray a core basic belief without betraying yourself. That's why people very, very rarely change their positions. You know, if, if, if the Jew in Weimar, Germany, and I hate using this example, if he has to concede to this horribly autistic German, you know, artist who's arguing with him that, you know, what's good for his community, you know, it, what's bad for his community is good for Germany. You know, he can't betray his community. That's a core belief of his. Turning his back on his community would mean that he's less of a person, less of a man. Uh, but, but, but of course, convention forces him to assert that the good of Germany overall is his primary concern, and, and that leads to essentially a lie. And that leads to a misunderstanding. And behind every misunderstanding, behind every lie, there is a possibility for conflict. There is a possibility for war. What we have is the ability to say, hey, you know what? What I really care about is the continuation of my own people. And I understand that that has to be sublimated broadly to the survival of the human race overall. But if we're being honest about... <laughs> If we're being honest with ourselves, there is no survival of the human race without the survivals of individual peoples. And, and, and furthermore, our, our current crop of leaders are not doing what's best for the survival of the human race and the continuation of its relationship with God at all. And in many ways, what, what it seems increasingly with, this, with, with these horribly soulless technocrats is the melting down of individual distinction is only there so that they can deracinate humanity to the point where humanity is fine with its own extinction. Who is actually fine with the extinction of humanity at the hands of, of, of the singularity? Is it the people who love their own particular version of humanity, whether that is, you know, Yoram Harzoni loving his own Jewish people, or, you know, Yiz the eunuch loving her own middle American white people, or whether it's uh, Erdogan loving his own Turkish people, or some Russian nationalist loving his own Russian people, or some Ukrainian nationalist loving his own Ukrainian people. Are those the people who, who don't really understand the value of continuing on the species? Or is it the derationated video game addict? Is it the guy that has uh, the, the, the porn-addled coom brain? Is it the soulless bureaucrat in the EU the, the, the mindless NGO apologist for the World Economic Forum. It's, it's those later cases that don't really have an understanding of, of what it means uh, to survive as a species. They don't even have a very firm appreciation of what it means to exist as a, as a sentient organism. All they have is an understanding of consumption, an understanding of spreadsheets, an understanding of a mechanistic relationship, and that that is not life. Uh, PBK for $25 Canadian. Hey, Dave, no question this time. Just wanted to thank you for introducing me to basket weaving. We had a good book club going on in Toronto. I would highly recommend any fellow Leafs in the greater Toronto area to come out for it. Well, that's amazing. We used to have people in Toronto who said that there were absolutely no basket weaving opportunities there. So I'm gl glad that we could really get that started up. Uh, guys, if you, if you might have realized that May has been an incredibly difficult month for me in terms of content creation, I'm trying to get a bunch of basket weaving projects off the ground, but I have to work on a variety of stuff before that. I have to write my Sildings talk. I have to, you know, uh, 
you know, prepare for, for I have to actually work a 50 hour a week job. So, but, but I, I see a lot of productive stuff coming out of basket weaving and the Sildings conference itself is going to be a huge boost for that project. Just recently, the Beowulf Foundation has launched another server. It's, it's essentially a matrix server, but it's mirrored on Discord, which is how most people use it. And uh, that server is essentially for the exchange of gig economy things. So if you have skills that you're trying to sell, or if you have uh, a business you're trying to promote, this server is a server that you might want to uh, look for an invite to. <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to go on uh, to the next one. Thank you very much. Uh, other name for $3 USA. Have you been paying attention to community notes? Allowing people to watch the narrative fall apart in real time might be the best thing to happen for the right in a while. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have watched community notes and they are absolutely deadly to the mainstream narrative. They are waking a lot of people up. But okay, I mean, let's let's be honest about this, guys. We all know what's coming. Elon Musk is moving away from a leadership role as leader of Twitter and a manager is coming. To replace him, that manager is going to be looking to be employed by another company. They're going to be looking to be known as the CEO that, that saved Twitter. And part of saving Twitter in the eyes of the mainstream media is making it adhere at least a little bit to woke protocols. Almost certainly, community notes will, in some very, very imminent point in the future, be taken over by woke AI. Because the way it's being done currently, where it's individual contributors just pointing out notes that they can take off of Wikipedia, written in value-neutral language, that's embarrassing the media too much to be allowed to stay. Uh, unless Elon Musk specifically lobbies for this and makes this a point for his replacement when, when he appoints her, uh, I would say that... The mainstream media is community notes is the first thing in their crosshairs because because it's costing them the most. It's costing them the most amount of, of embarrassment in the short term. But but guys, in the meantime, there's going to be a gap of six months to a year, maybe two years, where that community notes function is going to be based. Our job is to read people enough intellectuals about asymm the factual asymmetry between what the mainstream media promotes and what actually is the evidence stuff on the ground statistically. This is, this is in, in some sense, this is what I'm saying, that HBD is simultaneously the least important and most important thing. It is the least important because IQ and the minor differences that, it, and, and, you know, in the great scheme of things, they're minor, uh, and, and the differences that exist between different groups uh, uh, spread across the world. In the great scheme of things, that's not that big of a deal. It, 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 in many ways, it's a good thing because people are good at different things. And that means different civilizations are going to have different talents, talents, different charisms, different gifts. They're, they're going to be able to have different perspectives that they bring to the table. And they should be preserved in their own right. It, 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 again, for the good of humanity overall, they should be preserved in their own right. Um, but in another way, HPD is the most important thing because it shows how the management of almost all Western cu cultures is pathologically incorrect. And our elites have been making a number of bets and have been asserting the exact opposite of reality for 20 or 30 years now. And until that's internalized by people like James Lindsay and Sam Harris and Brett Weinstein, until they come to terms with this reality and see how far off the mark. Like, for years, while they were trying to harangue Christians for believing in intelligent design, they were essentially okaying policy that was predicated on a very demonstrable biological reality not being true. They need to internalize that reality before they're brought back to the table in any meaningful way. Because only that reality will give them the proper epistemic humility and their proper skepticism towards what's presented as the science to actually do politics and contribute to politics in a meaningful way. Even if they're data heads, even if they're supposed to represent the best of science, they need to understand how 
and the context of making actual political decisions, what is evidenced in the data very rarely is the thing that is the crux of the decision, and it can't be. And also a reason for not letting chat GPT run your country as well. But <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much for that super chat. Creeper Weirdo for $5 USA. I finally finished A Clockwork Orange. That book's ending really was disappointing. It was one chapter too long. The movie was funnier than I expected, and I still recommend the book. I'm telling you, Dave, there is a resonance there. Yeah, yeah um, so here's the thing. You know, there's this always, there's this joke about progressives where they always go, and there's this, this is a show called Portlandia, and the funniest skit they did in Portlandia was this skit called Did You Read It? which was, it was these two insufferable progressives. And they always, um, every time they met, they tried to like one up each other about all the things they read and, and look down at the other person, but because they hadn't read it yet. Um, and, and this is, this is always the got you. Did you read it? Did you read it? Uh, the, the thing is the, the, the real crux of the matter is it doesn't matter whether you read the book or not. It, and this, maybe this is a very Catholic perspective because for the most part, you need at least like two or three readings to get the book down uh, for in the long term. And in the uh, in the grand scheme of things, you know, you're not going to remember it. So Aristotle had an enormous impact on my worldview. So did Plato. I read those books like I mean, I read most of the dialogues and the Republic and 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 and, and I read all of the ethics and you know, a, a variety of the other books by Aristotle, um, the physics and stuff like that. Uh, this is part of a book group where we went, we went through the entire collected work. So I know it was on, that was on, on, on the menu, but, but I'm, I'm like 15 years away from that now. I'm 15 years. How, how am I supposed to have memory of that? You know, I, I remember broad strokes. I remember the key takeaways, but the, these things are, are are very distant for me. A Clockwork Orange I read in high school, and, and I seem to remember it being really good, but I seem to remember having an artificially happy ending, as you're implying here. The book that I remember by the same author, Anthony Burgess, that was a lot better was The Wanting Seed, which I remember thinking, in hindsight, was, was very prophetic. But again, I'm 15 years away from that book. I remember almost nothing about it. So, you know, your mileage will vary. But but yeah, I mean, I think Burgess was somebody who who, who had an understanding of the technocratic evolution. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he modeled his own future society on, on Burnham. I, I really wouldn't. But at any rate, thank you for the super chat. Thomas Bentaras for $5 USA. I long that Lindsay is not one of our guys. Isn't it useful to have somebody reading all those awful papers coming out of academia and NGOs? This makes up a lot of his podcasts until a while ago, I guess. And I don't know that anyone else is doing it. Okay, but this is the whole problem. And maybe I didn't make this point enough in my talk. Um, these papers, progressives just read these papers so that they can one-up each other. They don't actually inform their worldview. Matt McManus probably internalized roles very well, but I don't think he internalized half a dozen of the authors he's read. Uh, I think that he, he reads them and he memorizes small little facts from them, but that's not driving the worldview. What's driving the worldview is an emotional fascination with the civil rights movement and the end point of the civil rights movement prophesied by people like John Lennon and all of the visionaries and luminaries of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and sometimes 90s. And, and, and a, a religious adherence to want to see the fulfillment of that emancipatory vision and a dedication to put yourself forward as a saint of that new order that is imminently coming and, and an enemy of the heretics that stand out from that order. Um, these papers that, that James Lindsay dives into I mean, there are some exceptions like, un, you know, the, the, what was that? I can't remember who the author was, but unpack, unpacking the invisible knapsack uh, of white privilege. That, that's a seminal work and you can read that if it gives you some insight. You know, you can, you can read a variety of other ones, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw, 
uh, Derek Bell, all these people. But I mean, this is not, you know, this this stuff is is not actually what's motivating people. Uh, das Kapital is not what's motivating most Marxists. Das Kapital, they, they didn't read CMC, MCM, and go, oh my God, I'm a communist now. They were brought to the cause of communism because it offered an alternative to the liberal economic world order, and it presented with them with a heroic vision that was still in keeping with, with the, the sort of DEI, emancipatory vision of, of progressivism uh, classically, uh, but at the same time was separate from it, and that was less autistic, less pedantic about them being white males. That's what drew people to communism, absolutely. So I don't know, if, if you want someone going over all, all of these papers from the 80s, sure. But what I'm telling you guys is that we don't need bibliography generators. I, I don't want to be like, but you know, we don't need people who just spit out lists of authors behind the arguments they're making. It, it, you know, I think the Lotus Eaters are much better at this, is that the Lotus Eaters read a book and at least the ones I've seen, at least the podcasts I've seen, I'm not, I'm not subscribed to them with the paid plan, so I've only seen the ones that are public. But it is apparent that they do try to take an intuitive approach to, to authors and try to internalize what they're saying. And, and that's much, much more useful. Uh, if you're reading a book and you're only there to deconstruct it, you're not reading the book properly. At minimum, what you should be asking yourself is, what do the people who like this book get out of this book? The answer for virtually all of these dry academic papers is, this gives me more ammunition to prove that I'm a smart person and justify myself as the avatar of the new civil rights movement, as an avatar of social justice. That is honestly what most people get for, from all of, of, of this dross that comes out of the academy. Yeah, I mean, I, again, is, some, is having people who read these papers useful to us? Yes. Is having a person who reads these papers who doesn't talk to us and calls us their enemy is useful to us? No. I mean, essentially, James Lindsay is no more accessible to me than, than the people who actually write the stuff in the colleges. Neither of them will talk to me. James Lindsay turned down a conversation with, with Paul Gottfried you know, the granddaddy of, of sort, sort of, uh, one, of the, one of the granddaddies of, of paleoconservatism and, and, a, and a student of Marcuse, too. He literally studied under the guy that James Lindsay read. James Lindsay, if someone does not want, if somebody reads Marcuse but is totally uninterested in, 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 in having a conversation with the living grad student of Marcuse, who is in his own right a prominent author, then that person is not a serious intellectual and not somebody that is at all useful to us in any capacity. Remember, most reading is, is essentially to develop an intuitive understanding of the other person as a thinking individual, either as a living thinking individual or as a dead thinking individual, as a person from history, as a historical thinking individual. It's not simply to develop a bibliography to fire at people in, in, in rhetorical contests. That, that's what progressives do. That, that's what leads to institutional brain. Uh, that's, that's what leads to an entire generation of academics not really caring that you have to make your entire public-facing persona a lie. Chase, hey Dave, great stream. Sounds like this would be a great essay and plugged into the Sensible Center platform. Uh, I think this might be somebody I know in real life, in which case, Chase, great to see you here. <laughs> I'll, I'll buy you a beer with your Super Chat money next time. Uh, so, but it's it's great seeing you. And um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm still behind writing my Soldings talk. So that's going to take priority over writing any new essays. Uh, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to finishing the Soldings talk so I can actually write new stuff. And, and also not being quite so busy. Creeper Weirdo for $3 USA. Nashville changed something. I'm tired of people forgetting that. It's not about some girl, girl on butter anymore. It's not about some girl on butter anymore. 
This feels different. The real problem is we're not using the power correctly. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, I see. Nashville. You're not talking about the Sildings Conference in Nashville last year. You're talking about the Nashville shooter. That's the girl on butter. I don't know what butter means, but I assume you mean the transgender person who, who shot up the school. Um. Well, okay. So, well, how should the, 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 the issue is, is that Nashville, the Nashville shooter did wake up a lot of Christians to their situation. You are right. We are not using the power properly. What we need to use the power to do is to create a huge network of people that can positively create their own products and their own brands that stand apart from the woke apparatus. And we need to ta attack the Civil Rights Act and the human resources regime in these new corporations as much as possible. And we need to take them to court and challenge it there. Um, okay, thank you, Creeper Weirdo. Uh, I'm going to move on because I'm not quite sure how to answer that because of the ambiguity, but thank you very much. Ugh. Well, it's uh, getting late. Adam Keeney for $5 USA. Calling the Budweiser situation a boycott feels like hiking in the woods, finding a dying deer, and declaring oneself a hunter. Um, I guess so. I might disagree with you here, Adam Keeney. Like, actual energy was used in this boycott. Bud Light was a dying product. It's not even, I don't think it's, I mean, it certainly does not create the future for Anheuser-Busch. Anheuser-Busch doesn't see it as their future, certainly. Uh, but Red America did move the needle. What can I say? They, they were successfully able to use democratic energy to accomplish something. It's not something that's, that's going to last a long time, but it, but it is something. It is, it is something that, that it, it, it will, it did move the needle. The question is, in three months, so imagine yourself in four months, you look back on the Budweiser boycott. What was accomplished? Who was fired? Who was hired? What companies were created? What networks were built that are friendly to you? And what enemy networks that your enemy uses can no longer be used? If the answer is to all of that thing, no, 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 none of that happened, but boy, did we make a lot of noise, and that political action is, is useless. A positive political action I always bring up is Twitter being taken over by Elon Musk. What was the consequence of Twitter being taken over by Elon Musk six months out? Well, let's see. We totally fired the administrative staff of Twitter, creating a template for other administrative staffs being fired from other tech companies, which massively decreased the power of wokeness in the tech firm and made it very much harder for them to fire people in cancellation campaigns. Not impossible. It still happens a lot. But this signaled the, uh, 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 a flagging away from the hard wokeness that had been going on since 2020. It gave us breathing room. Second of all, the removal of the blue check system from our enemies, which makes it harder for them to determine friend enemy and makes it easier for us to determine friend enemy. Three, the unbanning of many accounts and, and the return of things like frog Twitter. And four, community notes, which embarrasses our enemies in real time. Those are four permanent benefits that were gotten by Twitter's purchase. What are four permanent benefits that are going to emerge under the Budweiser boycott in four in four to six six to four four to six months? And and there's no answer because there probably aren't going to be any. Um, that's weird, creeper weirdo. Um, I don't know why that's not untagging. Okay, I may have lost my pinning functionality, but we'll see here. Um, okay, well, I will continue reading these even if I can't pin them. But I'm wondering why all of a sudden, I'm gonna reload this, see if it works. Sorry guys, a little bit of a delay here. Okay, where were we? Um, no, 
Nope. Uh, this is frustrating. Okay, well, guys, I'm going to turn this off and just read them manually. I'm afraid. I don't know why M Entropy suddenly stopped working. But I can't reconfigure it without just disrupting the stream. So you'll just have to tolerate me reading these things in real time. Creeper Weirdo for $3 USA. Interesting argument. Counter argument. Three dead kids. And the people who defended the killer. Uh... Okay, I'm not so sure I understand that. So, interesting argument. Counter argument is three dead kids and the people who defended the killer. <laughs> okay, so what you're saying is that... But, I mean, I don't know who can you punish for that, creeper weirdo, right? Um, so, we're angry about Nashville. What happened? The left mobilized. The right couldn't counter mobilize, specifically because the right didn't have a good target. The, all the right had was the left sick their professional protesters out on the uh, on the Tennessee legislator. They got away with it because they always do because they had mainstream media support. And what could the right do? It could counter protest that never works. Uh, but there are no soft targets in in any of that. It's hard to know who they they could go after. The only thing that they could try to do is they could try to get freedom of information on the trans uh, on the on the shooter's manifesto. That that might work, uh, but other than that, I'm not so sure really how that energy could, energy could be used in a productive way. Creeper weirdo again for three dollars, saying this one is an apology for the last super chat. Got a bit steamed. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right, man. Um, I appreciate it anyway. Um, this is very strange. I feel like my entropy is not working, but. That seems to periodically happen. Okay, that's still not working. All right. Okay, Nerve and B Maker for $25 USA. Your debate with Matt highlighted that the right and left have very different definitions of the word exploitation. Right wingers think that porn is exploitative because it is degrading to show your nudes for money. The left thinks that it's exploitative because they think the person showing their nudes should get 15% more for them. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess so. They, they might also believe, I mean, if they believe in the labor theory of value, they might think that the, the state should pay you to, to, to show your nudes, even if no one's buying them. So ugly people or people who have unattractive bodies or disabled people uh, might, might, you know, I, I didn't ask this to Matt, but, but he might believe that if if a if a very ugly person has an exhibitionist fetish, that the state should literally pay them to have an OnlyFans account the same amount that an attractive person would, because I don't know labor theory of value, equal dignity, equality of economics, as Matt is fond of saying. Um, this is you know you could you could come up with all of this, but but Nerve and B Maker, that's not the problem. The problem is is that. Matt's foundational basic belief is in emancipation and liberty, and my foundational basic value is in family formation and in the continuation of the human race and its relationship with God. That comes into conflict with pornography. That it, It's very simple in the pornography case, right? In the pornography case, you see things hurt family life, but to you know but to to limit them would be to, to limit the freedom of the individual and matt explicitly said it, that even if it destroys family life even if it destroys community even if it destroys human health and well-being he still would rather have liberty over all of that i mean it's it's liberty towards suicide and you know people are going to choose suicide and, I mean, if you choose that as your ethics, then your ethics are going to commit suicide. And it shouldn't be surprising. Uh, Owen Zelensky for $10 USA. Good evening, Dave. I just wanted to say thank you for all the advice you've given me. I started my substack and put out my work, including my poem, Ballad of Billy the Kid vs. Dracula. I don't want to post just to post my substack without your permission, so I hope you enjoy this gift. Thank you very much. Well, um, 
I will look up that poem on Substack. I always want to encourage creators. If it's a short poem, I'd read it on stream. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, Julio for $15 USA. Hi, Dave. Are there any particular ways? Julio, for $15, $15. Hi, Dave. Are there any pe uh, peculiar ways to one signal... Peculiar ways one signals wealth and status in America? Example, in Scandinavia, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, you would wear hiking clues everywhere and go drive a Tesla and spend your holidays doing something sporty. Too expensive tastes are seen as unfashionable. Well, I mean, that's more or less what, you know, what high status people do in America High status people in America aren't, A, they're not fat, because being overweight is obviously a low-class thing. Uh, B, they, they, they very much advertise. I mean, this is, sounds like more or less the same thing that you're talking about here. The professional class always advertises their luxury opinions, their sporty hobbies, and their, um, and, and, uh, and sort of, um, their, um, I guess, just their general health, usually. So, sometimes they advertise what they've read if they're on a more academic set. But, but those are the three things. And since status is conferred universally in this class, it's not surprising that they're the same that are in Scandinavia. Uh, for, for the alternative elite, uh, status will have to be signaled through family size. And uh, not, not family size itself, but just, just pronatalism and, and having families that you take care of very well. It will have to be a point of status because I'm, I'm really, really tired of... This is also another thing, too, is that if you're really elite in America, you, you aren't ostentatiously LGBTQ. Like if you are gay or if you have those proclivities, they're never really expressed in your day-to-day -day appearance. The people who walk around the streets with, you know, raggy tie-dyed clothes and and, and kind of you know, half-accomplished transitions, those people are all uniformly sort of middle-class Johnny-come-latelys to, to, to the professional class stuff. So that, that's another thing you see a lot, too. Uh, and really what we're talking about is if if there's going to be a rival elite class to the existing class of professionals they will have to make bodily health a priority and sports a priority because that that immediately signals to people that you're high status if you eat better if you if you if you look like you're in better health people will immediately assume that you're higher status so in this way, you can see how, how the dark elves are going to kind of come onto the scene. Uh, they can't be overweight uh, people with very, very poor health who, who eat crap processed food. This is one of the reasons why bug burgers never take off, because in order for eating bugs to filter down properly through the culture, the upper class has to do it first. And the upper class of the PMC isn't going to do that because if they discard their sort of Michael Pollan omnivores dilemma, uh, fruit and wine, I, I eat good foods, they're immediately going to signal to the rest of the people that they are lower class and, and, they'll, and they'll lose status very, very quickly. Osborne. Um, I myself, for $5, I myself am making a story trilogy with Anglo-American tradition it ties together past, present, and future. Relatable in a way to Lord of the Rings, in my opinion. A big adventure with many memory triggers and inspirations. Sci-fi military history drama. So, Osborne, are you talking about writing a book? Is it a book idea? Um, I, I definitely encourage people to write books. Uh, obviously, there's no shortage of new publishing houses that are looking for stuff to publish. So if you have short stories or books that you're looking to publish, I highly encourage you to submit them to the Passage Press, to Arcdos, um, to, uh, to oh my God, Imperium Press. Uh, all of those people are looking for more stuff to publish. And so, you know, uh, get into print, guys. That's the way to do things. 
Uh, Sam, one, five, three, ten dollars USA. On the contrary, your streams aren't long enough, but I wish you, uh, but I wouldn't wish that upon your vocals. Cheers, Dave. Well, thank you very much, Sam, one, five, three. I think we're coming to the end of the super chats and more or less the end of the hour. Uh, Nerf AMV maker for three dollars. If you like McCarthy for his Silence of God theme, then you must read The Crossing. It's his most thoughtful and dramatically impactful book. The ending is a spiritual tragedy of the highest order. Well, I have to say, Nerve and V-Maker, I've been impressed every time I've read a Cormac McCarthy book. He's one of my favorite authors. He's certainly, I think, one of the greatest living authors that we have among us right now. And so... Well, I haven't read The Crossing. It certainly sounds like a very, very uh, good book. Well, guys, um, I don't want to prolong this past the three-hour mark. Uh, I, I, I have a tendency to keep these things going on too long. So since I'm at the end of my own Super Chats, I'm going to get on to reading tonight's psalm. Uh, I actually don't remember what psalm we were on. I think it was Psalm 7. So after that, unless there is an emergency last super chat, which I still have time to read, we will close out the evening. Psalm 7 says, Lord God, I take refuge in you. For my pursuer, save me and rescue me, lest he tear me to pieces like a lion and drag me off with no one to rescue me. Lord God, if my hands have done wrong, if I have paid back evil for good, I who saved my unjust oppressor, then let my foe pursue and seize me. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my soul in the dust. Lord, rise up in your anger. Rise against the fury of your foes. My God, awake. I will give my judgment. Let the company of nations gather around you, taking your seat above them on high. The Lord is judge of the peoples. Give judgment for me, Lord. I am just and innocent of heart. Put an end to the evil of the wicked. Make the just stand firm, you who test mind and heart, O just God. God is the shield that protects me, who saves the upright of heart. God is a just judge, slow to anger, but he threatens the wicked every day, men who will not repent. God will not sharpen his sword, he has braced his bow and taken aim. For them he has prepared deadly weapons, he barbs his arrows with fire. He is one who is pregnant with malice conceives evil and brings here is one who is pregnant with malice conceives evil and bring forth lies he digs a pitfall digs it deep and in a trap he has made he will fall his malice will recoil on himself on his own head his violence will fall i will thank the lord for his justice i will sing to the lord the most high all right guys I'm going to check for one last time for the Super Chats. It looks like there's none. So in that case, I will probably see you next week for another stream that will be a little bit more dedicated to talking about what I expect in the Sildings conference that's upcoming. And until then, I will, ta I will hope you, <laughs> I will wish you the best week. I will wish you a blessed evening and good luck 